Good morning. Good morning to those who are online. Good morning to those who just woken up. And good morning, of course, to those who are present here in Riga, in Hans Sperons. My name is Eva Johansson, and I'm a culture journalist. But today I'm honored and happy to be the host of the first ever conference organized by Riga Jurmala Music Festival. I must confess I was a bit surprised that the classical music festival wants to touch the digital transformation theme. But as we all know and heard in the news, of course, the COVID-19 pandemics has hit hard the cultural uh, field and, of course, the creative industries. I think it's the right time to speak about how we contribute to the culture by the digital means. And, of course, it has, the digital uh, technology has changed the ways how we distribute and how we um, create the culture. That is why the aim of today's conference is to raise a discussion about the digital transformation and its benefits for culture. Today, we will offer you to hear a variety of really excellent international speakers who will share their experience from their organization, uh, organizations uh, to, in order to benefit your organization. And this conference is supported by the Swiss Embassy in Latvia and Society Integration Foundation. What is going to happen today? We are going to put this conference in three parts. The first part will be dedicated to the question very simple question, actually. Why is digitalization in culture important? The second part will be dedicated to the question of digital transformation of artistic creation. So we'll meet some artists as well. And the third part is actually a really practical one. Digital transformation of cultural management. Before we start, I would like to go through some practical details. The first one is we're going to work today until 2.30 p.m. without a pause. Also, this conference is available in English language and in Latvian translation. Tiem, kuri vēlas Latviešu tulkojumu lūdzu dodieties uz Rīga Jūrmala festivāla mājas lapu rīga.domzīmejūrmala.com un izvēlaties sadaļu konferenci, uzspiediet Latviešu valodu un jūs saņemsiet tulkojumu Latviešu valodā. Also, we would like to interact with you, so uh, as you are not able to be present here in Hansa Sperons in Rīga, it's a beautiful day actually, we would like you to uh, join us by Slido asking questions to the speakers, to the panelists, to me or whom else you want to ask the question, and I will ask those questions uh, during the part of discussions. Uh, another thing, uh, I was wondering if you have tried to use Slido.com. There's a very good thing you can use, a tool you can use to ask questions, and also we can ask questions to you and interact with you. Um, I would like to ask you to open the slido.com, um, either on your phones or laptops. Um, so write slido.com, and the way to use it is really simple. You just put the hashtag in the tab. You can write uh, the hashtag of today, which is digiculture. Thank you for joining us, and uh, you can see the question there. Uh, for us, uh, we would like to see who is attending the conference today, and uh, we would like to ask the question, which area are you representing, or at least you can think you can represent today? Is it public, private, non-profit, or self-employed? So let's see. Oh, so far it's non-profit, but let's wait for more answers. There is zero private and zero self-employed. I was expecting more self-employed today. All right, we can see that majority, oh, it's, no, it's public too. And some privates joined. Oh, nice. I, I, I think maybe some of you are uh, using Slido for the first time. It's a really good tool actually to, to interact. So I can feel that someone is watching this conference as well. Um, okay, we can see we have still no one uh, self-employed here. I was expecting some artists who are self-employed, but still the majority now is the public sector, which means someone from the government, someone from institutions. Uh, this is an international conference, so there are many uh, participants abroad. Yes, uh, so we can see uh, now the results. The public is 44%, nonprofit 44%, private 13% of today's uh, audience, and there is zero self-employed. But I think maybe they will join us later when we're going to talk about um, creating uh, digital arts. So, um, also, uh, I would like you to uh, be really brave and ask questions today. I'll be very happy and pleased to ask those questions to, to people we are going to hear today, and the speakers are really, really excellent. Um, it is time to give a floor for opening speeches. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, today's conference will be opened by the Culture Minister of Latvia, Nauris Puntulis. The Honorable Foreign Minister, dear speakers and those who are watching the live stream, 
Cultural and creative industries have been hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic, with live performances grinding to halt and places of culture shutting their doors for long periods of time. At the same time, the pandemic has accelerated digital transformation of our lives by many years, profoundly changing the ways we live, work and interact with one another. Emergence of digital technologies has revolutionized all areas of human life, not the least the ways we create and consume culture. Albeit the digital shift entails a number of challenges it also allows for a creation of new cultural expressions and reaching of new audiences. To their credit, cultural and creative industries facing the difficulties created by the pandemic have embraced the digital shift and are now in a perfect position to emerge from the crisis stronger and smarter than they were before. To support its cultural and creative industries both during the crisis and in its aftermath, Latvia is drawing up policies and strategies designed to mitigate the current challenges and to take advantage of the future opportunities. Implementation of the digital shift in the cultural has thus become one of the top priorities for cultural policymakers. Latvia already ranks among the top 10 countries globally by its internet connection speed. We have a strong and innovative ICT sector and we pride ourselves in such fields as language, technologies and e-government. We are also world-renowned for our creative talent, especially in the field of music. Combining these two forces should allow us to become a country that is actively involved in building global knowledge, fostering culture and advancing technological development. Thank you, Minister um, of Culture of Latvia. Uh, in 2021, uh, so this year we are celebrating 100 anniversary since Switzerland, the Jura recognized Latvian's independence. And also this conference couldn't happen without our Swiss partners. That is why I would like to give the floor for opening speech to the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Switzerland, Ignacio Cassis, who happened to be in Latvia right now. Please video. Honorable Minister of Culture, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Latvian. I am delighted to open today's conference, Digital Transformation in Culture. I cannot be physically present due to scheduling reasons, but I can nevertheless welcome you virtually, and I do so sincerely. It also seems appropriate for this conference, doesn't it? Of course, after keeping our distance for a long time, we are all looking forward to a more physical relationship. The last few months have shown us that we were able to overcome any distance if we want to. We have experienced the opportunities that digitalization offers in our daily interactions at work, in our global fight against the pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, I am already fully immersed within the topic. I could also talk about the opportunities, the challenges and the diversity that digitalization offers. However, if I did so, I would take away all the fun from this conference. I am very happy to act as the starting signal for this colorful and diverse exchange. Opening today's conference makes me feel proud for two reasons. On one hand, because the topic of digitalization is a priority in Switzerland's foreign policy. On the other hand, because Latvia and Switzerland are also celebrating a very special anniversary this year. 100 years ago, Switzerland officially recognized Latvia's statehood. The 100th anniversary of our recognition of Latvia's independence is not only an occasion to reflect on the history of our two countries. The anniversary also offers the perfect opportunity to reflect on our cultural bond. Did you know that there were several Latvian artists who lived in Switzerland during the creative phase? Artists like the two Latvian poets Rainis and Asphasia. The creative work contributed to strengthening of Latvian con consciousness and national feeling, which 
ultimately led Latvia's independence. The years they spent in Lugano, my hometown, were very significant in the, this respect. There is even a museum in Castagnola to honor and preserve their legacy. Ladies and gentlemen, the celebration of the past, it is one thing we like to do during such a special occasion. The other thing to look ahead, to look into the future. And one thing is clear, the future is digital. This also applies to culture and the arts. Digital technology gives us powerful tools to better preserve our cultural heritage for the new generations. It also enables artists to connect with the world and reach new audiences. Finally, yet importantly, digitalization also offers entirely new ways of creating new masterpieces. Today's conference is designed to explore and discuss the diversity of digitalization in culture and to promote our mutual exchange. Let us use our 100-year history as an opportunity to lay the foundation for the next century of partnership between Latvia and Switzerland. Let us be creative, let us inspire each other and, most of all, let us have a colorful exchange. Paldies, thank you so much. Thanks to our partners in Switzerland for inspiring words. But there's one person who is really keen to digitalize culture and also asking and inviting others doing so, and that is executive director of Riga Jurmala Festival. Ladies and gentlemen, Zane Chulkstan is present here in Hans Esperance. Good morning. Um, good morning, uh, everyone, and thank you for for joining. Uh, I guess it's it's not only Eva who was surprised to to see that a classical music festival uh, is organizing an international conference on uh, digital transformation. Well, you shouldn't be surprised because uh, obviously this year has been very hard for for all of us. Uh, but in some weird ways, it has also given us uh, a bit more time and and space to. Uh, uh, to, to think about where we want to go, to experiment, <laughs> to, to do some things that we have been postponing for, for years. Um, thus, Rigor Jurmala Festival, for example, of course, was forced to cancel uh, last um, season's festival, but uh, instead uh, we started a uh, um, truly meaningful and widely successful series of online masterclasses we ventured into producing uh, 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 a full documentary on, on legendary Latvian uh, maestro Maris uh, Janssons. We have been also experimenting with, with chatbots, with different automated marketing uh, solutions. We've been trying to find new ways to reach uh, our audiences. So I guess every cloud has a, a silver uh, lining. Obviously, also, automation and digitalization is nothing new, but pandemic has accelerated it by, on average, seven years. So, during this year, it has become very painfully <laughs> clear that either we will lead that change or we will be left behind. And uh, this is our way uh, in, in trying to, <laughs> to, 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 to lead this. Uh, um, and we hope that we will, uh, we will be able to, to learn from the best, but also starting from next year already present uh, some of the cases and, and uh, solutions. Uh, I'm deeply thankful to all the amazing speakers that found time to join us and to, to, to speak today. I'm very grateful to our supporters, which is uh, Swiss Embassy in, uh, in Riga and Society Integration Foundation, supported by Ministry of, uh, of, of Culture. And also huge thanks to our amazing team uh, that's on the other sides of the cameras that have worked day and night to to pull it uh, pull it all uh, off. Uh, thank you so much. So I guess uh, yes, let's let's do it. Uh, let's learn from the best. Then let's try to become ones. Thank you so much. Let's have an inspiring conference.
Thank you, Zani, for your speech. And uh, to show the digitalized world really works, could you open again slido.com and uh, use again the hashtag digiculture? You can see it on your screens and answer the question, is digital transformation part of your uh, priorities? Yes or no? You can see the answers right now. Everyone is saying yes. I believe it's uh, both about yourself and your organization about how you, as Zani mentioned already, we had this year was quite strange and also I attended some really interesting culture events like, uh, for example, um, culture a conference for mental health, which was held from London. It was really interesting how uh, the world was connected in that conference. It was a really interesting experience for me. And I saw that really uh, it can be reasonable and very caring art through the digital means. So everyone has answered yes. So I guess because that's why you are a part of this conference. And thank you for joining us again. So we can start our conference with the first block of speakers. Um, and this is dedicated to the question, why is digitalization in culture important? It seems a very obvious question, but I think there's really interesting uh, uh, matters and views. So the first speaker is Ben Lane, who represents the Art Council of England. He is a senior manager, enterprise and innovation, part of the team of Art Council England, set up to, amongst other things, also support the de development of innovation in arts and culture sectors, develop new approaches to grant funding, and encourage the take-up um, and effective use of digital technology. By the way, Ben's background is in music. Good morning, Ben. Are you here? So, Ben it will be here um, in five minutes. Um, so, we can maybe uh, have another Slido? Yes, uh, okay, uh, while we're waiting for Ben. I would like to ask the question, which areas of digital transformation are you planning on focus on? I think it's also an interesting question to answer to because uh, as you know, the digitalization can be done in many ways. That's why our conference is divided in three parts. So it's designed so we can also talk about practical matters like marketing and communications. As we can see, um, those who have joined are interested in that field. Also, I think using Slido is a good example how we can use digitalization you know, in conferences like this so we can feel your um, attendance here in the conference. And uh, I think that uh, also what Zane mentioned about uh, uh, Riga Jurmala Music Festival, I've been following it and I think those master classes that they uh, did for, uh, for artists and uh, Academy of Music were very famous in Latvia. So it was a good possibility, for example, like Misha Maisk is joining the Academy of, Ar of Music in Latvia so they could meet and talk. And uh, after that, doing the news, uh, I heard that students were very happy. So dig digitalization can work even in uh, hard times like this year. I guess it was hard for everyone. So you're still answering the questions. And uh, I think for those who have joined from um, NGO sector, I think all parts will be interesting. And I see also the fundraising. I, I hope that fundraising maybe be a bit more up than it is. But um, HR and fundraising is down. And finance, okay. But there are some more people answering the question. But still, the leader is marketing and communication. I think it could be uh, because of uh, the social media and actually today we are going to have some speakers who are really good at it uh, from London who has been working with Instagram. So we can see the band line is online. Uh, so we can start with him. Good morning, Ben. Do you hear me? I think you've muted yourself. You have to put on mute. <laughs> Hey, yeah, hey, yeah, I'm here. good morning. Hey, yeah. good morning. The floor is yours to give your first, the, you're the spur, first speaker of the conference. Congratulations. Uh, the floor is yours uh, to take uh, the conference over. Thank you very much. And you'll just have to excuse me. I'm just looking for my clicker on my phone so I can move my slides forward. One second. But thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I, I would wish I could be with you in person and learning more about your beautiful country. But thanks to the miracles of technology, I'm able to be with you from my home in Brighton on the south coast of the UK. So just one second. Oop. Oh. 
Here we go. Right. <laughs> so, good morning, and I'm here to talk to you today about a project that the Arts Council of England did uh, called the Digital Culture Compass. The Digital Culture Compass is a web-based tool for helping organisations to assess their digital maturity and to look for ways to try and improve it. Um, I'm going to give you a bit of background on the wider policy initiative that the Compass came out of. I'm going to talk to you a bit about the Compass and who built it and, and why we built it and how it works. And then uh, come on to discuss a little bit more some of the insights that the Compass is capable of generating for organisations. Before I move on, I just want to just to look at the title a bit, uh, Developing Digital Maturity. Um, firstly, the phrase digital maturity is something if you if you search on the Internet, you will find there are many different definitions of what digital maturity is. Um, uh, and I'm not going to go into into kind of all, all of that debate, but certainly for me, digital maturity is not about having the latest and greatest technology. Uh, it is more about understanding how and when to use technology. And it very much is also about your organization and its practices and its culture and the way it works. So a lot of it is about the way people work together, as I say, not necessarily just about technology. Also important in that title is the word developing and apologies for playing uh, word games when I know that uh, I'm of course talking in English and you'll be translating this into Latvian but um, I hope the distinction between developing and achieving comes across. Uh, one thing I would say is that uh, it's not so much about uh, uh, finding an end state. Uh, once you begin to understand digital maturity, you realize that it is an ongoing process. It's something that is always developing. OK, so let's just see if the clicker works. Here we go. Brilliant. So um, the Digital Culture Compass came out of a wider initiative called Culture is Digital that was initiated by the Department for Culture, Media and Sport in England, uh, the DCMS. And it was a piece of policy research uh, that looked into how to improve the uptake of technology in the UK's arts and culture and heritage sectors. Um, out of it came a number of policy recommendations that were delivered by all of the organisations you can see on this slide. You'll see there's a mixture of funders, of government departments and of recognisable cultural institutions in the UK like the Royal Opera House. There's a web address there on the bottom should you want to go and read the full report. Um, before I move on and talk more about the Compass, um, there were various policy recommendations that the Arts Council had to deliver and um, one of them I just wanted to pick up on was called the Digital Culture Network, in many ways a much bigger project than the Digital Culture Compass. Um, and the Digital Culture Network, our interpretation of this and what we executed was to put in place nine specialists in our offices across England, giving us geographical coverage, but also, as you'll see there, a number of specialisms that, uh, that sit within that network and uh, this means that arts and culture organisations in England are able to go and get bespoke advice uh, and the network also runs training sessions and also creates a lot of resources, help resources and if you want to have a look a bit more at those then I've put the web address for that on the bottom. Moving on to the Digital Culture Compass. So. Uh, Digital Culture Compass was commissioned jointly by ourselves and the National Lottery Heritage Fund, our sister organisation working in heritage. And we worked with a partnership of organisations who helped us build it. Um, very important that partnership uh, contains many organisations there who specialise in supporting the arts and culture sector in their efforts with digital. Uh, and so bringing them all together gave us a really good bank of knowledge on which to draw. There are two parts to the Digital Culture Compass. Uh, there is a, first of all, there's a written document called the Digital Culture Charter, and then there is something called the Tracker that we'll come on to in a minute. But I just wanted to focus quickly on the Cultural Charter and what this says. So this, um, as I say, is not, is not really an active tool. It's just a written statement, and you can go away and look at more of the details on this. But the three main... 
Um, the, the, the three main characteristics of this, the three main principles are to be values led, the idea that everything you do needs to sit under and come from your mission, vision and purpose, be people centered, so focus on the needs of your users, both external and internal, and finally, and importantly, be, be responsive to your context. So, uh, as I said at the beginning, digital maturity is not about having the latest and greatest in technology. It's understanding where you are and how you move forward. It may be that you're a very small organization who, who doesn't have a huge amount of technology. And so it's about understanding that actually that's the good place to start from. So the tracker, the tracker is the main element of the compass, and this is the interactive web-based tool. Uh, what it does is it divides the activities of arts and culture organizations up into 12 different areas. And you'll see those in the diagram on the right-hand side of this slide. Um, the, uh, the boxes in blue, the vertical boxes are really the kind of activities that sit at the core of an organization's mission. And these very much are dependent on context, what an organization does. So you'll see there, it uh, allows you to look at your artistic program. If you own a building, places and spaces, if you're a gallery or a museum, looking at your collections, etc. The boxes in gray are the kind of what we call the cross cutting functions. So these are functions that exist in most organizations and sit across all of their work. So at the top strategy and governance, and then all of the supporting functions underneath that. So underneath each of these 12 areas, there are between five and 10 questions uh, that really drill down into what kind of activity sits under all of these. And you're asked a series of questions, and then you're given a series of statements which you match yourself up against. And these use a, uh, a five point maturity scale. I want to come and talk a bit more about that in a second. Um, and there are some reoccurring themes that recur throughout the compass, looking at accessibility, looking at digital skills, looking at the use of tools and data. I mentioned the maturity scale, uh, and this uh, basically starts, uh, we'll just go through the initial managed, integrated, optimizing and transforming. Initial basically says, do you do it? Uh, Second, manage, do you plan to do it? Third, integrated, do you integrate those plans back into your organization's wider plans? Optimizing, do you collect data and feedback and use that to develop what you do? And then finally, transforming, and this is not something everybody should be aiming for, but does your uh, work in this area of activity help you to transform more widely across your organization? Just to show you very quickly what this looks like, and there are lots of words on these slides, so don't try to read them all, but you can see that you can go in here, you can select which parts of the compass you wish to use, and then once you're into those, you get these, quest these series of questions, a series of statements to match yourself against, allowing you to select where you are now and where you want to get to. Just before I move on very quickly, you'll see I've chosen here a question on recruitment management. And this is deliberate because I wanted to show you that the, some of the activities that, that you're asked to look at under the compass may not be things you've initially thought of as being digital activity. However, <clears throat> if you think about it, pretty much everything we do uses technology in some way. So even in recruiting, you're still advertising on the internet, you're still using social media, you're still probably using digital systems to help you manage the interview and selection process. <clears throat> so, uh, and just the next slide is just the, the second half of that page. So you'll see that the five maturity levels are there. You'll see also you get some, play, some uh, space to add some notes for yourself, because we hope that as you're using this, you realize there are activities you can do that will help you to achieve the next levels. <clears throat> Once you've completed it, uh, there's some very basic graphing in here that, that shows you your, your results. Uh, the, if you look at the graphs, the blue bars is where you are now. The green bars shows you the difference of where you want to get to. So looking at this example, you can see that um, this organization feels it's very nearly there with its program, but has a lot further to go with things like marketing and communications. So uh, just to, to kind of summarize, um, 
The Digital Culture Compass is a tool to generate insight. It is not a machine for giving you all the answers. It's a framework for helping you to ask the right questions. Secondly, the point I was just making that technology and users is used in areas that you may not have thought of as being digital. Um, from feedback from people who have used the compass, and certainly we designed it this way, it's best used with colleagues from across your organisation. It's probably not something that one person working on their own can do. And this is deliberate because we're trying to bring about conversations across your organisation to make sure that areas of good practice are shared. And then finally, uh, it's best used when you involve senior leaders because a lot of the actions that might come out of uh, your use of the compass might require organisational change. You very much need your senior leadership on board to help you do that. Um, so just some, some before I finish, some kind of thoughts from me uh, about how you develop digital maturity and how the compass supports this. So that first point, digital transformation is not about technology, it's about people. It's about how you use technology, it's about the culture of your organisation that allows you to, to, to use that technology but also allows you to be adaptive and to, to, to change. That change needs to be led from the top, as I've, as I've already said, and that um, the one one of the kind of the the um i think critical parts of achieving digital maturity and again certainly this is something the compass encourages is about breaking down silos between parts of your organization <clears throat> it requires you to be collaborative it requires your marketing team to be talking to your education team for example and then finally and i think this is a very important point that you should allow for experimentation, research and development and risk taking. Technology is always changing, uh, as, as you know, and that, the, 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 that, that change can be very rapid. Uh, and, um, and so you have to allow yourself time to, to experiment with, with new technologies and to work out what they can do, what the opportunities can do for you. Certainly through the pandemic, um, from, from where I've been sitting in England, we have watched many organizations who have uh, had to, to take their activities that they would normally do in person online. So whilst it's been a terrible time for the world, it's also by, been a time where, where that kind of culture of experimentation has been there by necessity. Uh, so certainly, as I say, from what I've been seeing, looking at applications for funding that have come across my desk, a lot of people have really kind of tried to do things differently. I think it's very important that we uh, that, that we don't lose that that kind of culture of experimentation. That we we take that forward. We take forward the fact that even organisations who may have been nervous of using technology in the past um, have, have actually found that that technology has. Um, and look, I don't want to say that technology is ever going to replace that experience of, of sitting in a in a beautiful concert hall and, and really hearing the sound and feeling the sound. It's, it's, technology will never do that for you. However, it does enable different kinds of experiences, different ways of reaching audiences uh, and certainly different ways of, uh, of, of, of creating new kinds of experiences. So it's very important that that is not lost. I think that's 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 it for me. Um, I hope you found this interesting. Please do go and have a look at the the compass if this is something that interests you. And uh, bear in mind, it's only one tool. It's only a tool. Uh, it's it, what's more important is the insight that it gains for you. And uh, yeah, well, I I, yeah, I, I hope you uh, I hope you continue to use technology in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben, for your presentation. Also, the putting the humans in the center of all this. Actually, we have one uh, comment or question from, uh, for, from, a, from a conference um, uh, viewer. Uh, the question is, how many organizations have signed the Digital Culture Charter and, uh, or used Tracker? Rig Jurmala have uh, used Tracker, uh, very useful, thank you. Can you answer this question? Um, yes, so in terms of the people that have signed up for the Tracker, there are about 500 currently. Uh, 
uh, in terms of the number of people from around the world who, who, have, who have looked at the compass, um, uh, last time I looked, which was last night, about 20,000 uh, people across the world have, have, have looked at the compass. The charter itself, and this was a long debate that we had, was whether to get people to actually sign up to that. It, it may be something that we do in the future, but we very deliberately positioned the compass as a tool that is for people to use that helps them. It is not there for the Arts Council to monitor that data and to, to, to kind of use it to, to, to tell people off with. So um, very much the, the ethos and the spirit of the compass is it's there for you to use. It's there to help you. It's not for us to spy on you. Thank you. There's another question. Uh, well, it's quite a philosophical one. Uh, it says, digital transformation is not about technology, it's about people. How do you start to change the culture? You mentioned that you start from the top, but maybe there is some other practical advice. I think collaboration is a, is a key word. Uh, certainly when we have seen this being used well and from talking to feedback from users, some of the best implementation of this has been when a working group has been drawn together that draws people from across different departments of an organization to really kind of work through these questions together. The, the compass is not about giving the right answers. It's about, as I say, the insight that's generated from working together in this way. So yes, it has to be led from the top, but that person at the top, those people at the top do not have to be the digital experts. They just need to be prepared to, to lead the change that the compass will, will hopefully give you insight to. Thank you for your presentation. Also, thank you for your uh, answers, uh, Ben. It was really worthful. Uh, if you can, you could stay for the discussion after the first block of, uh, block of speakers. Next speaker uh, today is uh, David Burke, the Chief Executive Officer of London's Philharmonic Orchestra. During his first COVID-struck um, year, David has overseen the orchestra transform its season into a series of 26 concerts created specifically for a film, dramatically increasing social media presence, promoting orchestral music to new audiences via Instagram. Uh, in our Slido, uh, Slido uh, we saw that most of you are interested in communication and marketing. I think that David is the right person. So let's uh, hear his presentation. Good morning, David. Morning. The floor is yours. Fantastic. Oh, thank you. I just need to, sorry, give me two seconds. The clicker, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even know it's possible to do this. It's technology. <laughs> okay, great. Here we go. So I, I thought I'd start by just um, I'd start by just giving a bit of background to the orchestra. I think our digital journey, as it stands, started back in uh, 2017. At the time, we were focused on live performance, uh, and as Ben said, I think organisationally it was all about the live. Um, we did, of course, have a, a strong uh, CD catalogue, which was doing download and sales. We had social media but it was focused towards generating audiences for, for public. Um, in 2017, two things changed. Um, the first was we were talking, we were writing our next mission, a uh, business plan and asking why we do what we do. And we changed the, the mission statement to be, uh, to be that we share the wonder of orchestral music with the modern world. And that actually opened up and gave us, a, empowered us to sort of think about it a lot more broadly than just the digital audience. Uh, and again, talking about from the top leadership, it, it gave the, the whole organization sort of free reign to think about what that meant and how we did what we did. The second thing we did, we appointed at that time a digital creative. So um, this is one person on one salary who was creating content for our social media. And I'll give you a couple of your examples in a minute. Um, but again, it took away that pressure of, of, of the financing, of sort of deciding how much money we have to take away from, from live to put into digital. It was one person there and their sole responsibility was creating content. Initially, the content was, was, was aimed at driving ticket sales, but further to that, it sort of progressed into um, 
into enabling us to uh, just build a, a, I guess I've heard people call it sort of build a fan base. It's sort of have that direct communication with our audience globally. I'll start with two examples. So here's a musicology side. Was really being pushed further than it had ever been pushed before. In the early 19th century, you would have had a four movement structure that started with a fast sonata form movement. You then would have had your slow movement adagio. Then there would have been a minuet and trio or a scherzo, and it would have ended again with another fast movement, such as a rondo. What Mahler does is he takes these slow movements and he gives them far more structural importance. He starts to connect them to the outer movements. They become far more than incidental, relaxing pieces to sort of give you a break from the outer movement. So that video was aimed at core audiences. Um, it's sort of giving them a greater depth of understanding, which means hopefully if they came to a concert or if they were listening to the piece online, this is talking about Mahler 4, which is on our CD label, then they would get a chance to uh, probably enhance their experience uh, and, and, part, and enjoyment of, of the piece. The second video uh, I just want to show is, was just for fun. Uh, and this is aimed at a more younger audience. So audience, feel free to play along at home. So as you can see, these gave fantastic insights into, into the orchestra and the music we're playing. Um, but then we were hit with COVID. Um, and effectively, COVID was a catalyst. It sort of really exploded how we thought about digital and what we would do. Uh, as Ben was saying, actually, it gave us license to experiment in a way that we wouldn't have done before, both because of uh, finances, but also because of time and focus. Um, so first of all, it gave us an opportunity to look creatively about the expertise we had within our, the skill of our artists who were initially sat at home with very little to do. Um, it then provided, as I said, so we looked at content which could provide insight into the orchestra, but then also bringing in the players themselves to show their personalities. It was initially focused at core audience, um, so they could engage the sort of people they knew on stage, who they'd seen week in, week out. They still had the security of that. If you remember back to sort of April, uh, May last year, when we were all isolating, it was a really scary time. And so having that connection with our audience is really important. But we can see actually it offered a really good opportunity to um, engage and with, with a much broader audience, um, both uh, internationally, but also in terms of demographics and age. And you can see that from the feedback we were getting on social media. It's really, really quite exciting. Um, so I guess we, 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 we sort of progressed it in two stages. So the first one was explore, exploring and engaging. And this is where we just did a lot, of, a lot of content. We were producing probably a video or a graphic or uh, an audio clip at least daily. Um, uh, it's sort of uh, so high content just to see what worked. And again, we had players at home uh, playing, recording on that album. So we did the um, uh, harp string quartet with Anne Sophie Mutter at home. Uh, which was, I think, seen by over half a million people. Um, we then actually, towards the end of, of the first lockdown period, we could start to bring musicians together. We, we had a session of uh, small ensemble work, and it was essentially to see how we could play at distance and to see how we could uh, manage the safety of getting players in a room. But we thought we'd film it. So again, our in-house man came uh, with a camera uh, and we filmed. Uh, and actually, it looked and sounded fantastic. So we put it online. And it got a huge amount of interest. We got uh, coverage by, uh, by international press. Uh, we got tens of uh, thousands of views. Uh, and we realized there was something into this. Uh, that also got us noticed by other organizations, people like the National Gallery approaches to see if we could do co-collaborations, which gave us a chance to reach their audiences and them to reach ours. So again, the proliferation of, of opportunity of reach was fantastic. Uh, as I said, it was all short form video, no longer than five, 10 minutes, all produced in house. So there was no cost associated. 
uh, and higher volume of content. Now, what it did take was man hours, and we again we re so we supplied people in the work uh, in the office. So our, our tours managers, because they could be planning tours, were became liaison on point with the players. But it was all a way of just making sure we could create and learn and see what audience liked. Then the second phase, you can see by the end of uh, of the summer when we were producing you know, full orchestras being stitched together, this was getting quite common, uh, and it, it was it was running its course. It, it's had its time. So we then went into sort of a refined production. We looked at what we would do for the rest of uh, the season. And I'll show you in a minute, I think. But to be really clear, we weren't looking to film concerts. We were producing concerts for film. It's a very different approach. Um, we then, uh, we'll have a couple of examples. So um, the two big decisions we made, one was we used a company called Intersection to come and do the filming. Now, Intersection have no background in working with orchestras, but they work uh, with people like uh, Damon Alban, Nick Cage, really interesting artists creating great work, and they are beautiful creatives. Um, we wouldn't have done this pre-COVID, but because we had the opportunity of the orchestra and an empty hall, we thought, let's, uh, let's, let's be bold. Let's try something different. And we used this as a feature. So we used really bold lighting. Uh, we used the highest quality of cap cinematic camera capture. Um, we looked at how we, we had cameras on stage walking amongst the musicians to get a real intimacy that would engage, engage audiences um, and that feeling of being inside. And we did that because you have to work harder on screen. In live, it's so, it, it hits you, the noise, you can feel the vibrations. On screen, you miss that. So to keep the engagement, to get someone to sit and watch for 30 minutes, an hour of music, it's got to be beautifully visually as well as audibly. The second decision we took was to work with a company called Marquee TV for distribution. So Marquee run a Netflix type model where you subscribe uh, and they already had a significant audience for, for opera and, and for ballet, uh, but they hadn't done classical music at the time. And so we were the first orchestra to sign up with them and we committed to do a regular series of concerts. So every Wednesday night over the autumn for 10, 10 weeks, there would be a new LPO concert. And then we insisted partly because a lot of the funding for this came from uh, from charitable sources, from public funding, that we wanted seven days to be free uh, before it went behind the paywall. It's behind the paywall for two years. So in terms of content for Marquee, it was really useful. Uh, and what was really interesting is really drove a new audience. So they found the audience was pretty evenly split between the three types, between LPO audiences that you could see when followed to Marquee, uh, the Marquee audience who jumped on classical music, and it's now the most popular art form on the, on the platform, uh, and then a new audience. Uh, which was really exciting because uh, I'll talk about this after the slide, but it, it was a complete new audience for both the LPO and for Marquee, and that, that is exciting. Um, I'll give you an example of what I meant by the filming, and you can see the quality of what we're doing. I hope you agree it, it's, it hits the mark. Hopefully that was enough of a teaser. As I say, if you subscribe to Marquee, you can uh, you can watch all of the pieces. The other key part of the deal with Marquee is that we could take small sections of the concert and put it onto our social media. So actually the Hillborg piece there, you can watch the entire piece on, on our YouTube 
uh, channel, um, which again is a really good way that we can look to build audience. Because actually we found over the summer that a lot of the, certainly the younger audiences weren't engaging for, for full length concerts, but they love the short form. And so this is a way of capturing the content, monetizing the capture of that content, but then also having it as a really great extension marketing tool. I think before COVID, we had two films, uh, uh, two concerts that we had filmed uh, in our history that the orchestra itself owned. Whereas now we've already got a catalog of, of, of 26, 27, um, and we're planning plenty more for the next couple of seasons. Um, I, after two years, the content all reverts back to us. We still have access. Actually, one concert we did try streaming in cinemas. Um, obviously, with COVID, it wasn't the right time for that. But there's other ways we can use this, the, the, these brilliant concerts to reach new audiences. And here's in terms of the audience. So first of all, there was our existing audience and we had some fantastic feedback from our, our, our loyal uh, supporters. And in terms of the model of the orchestra where we get 20% of our income from fundraising, this really helped with fundraising. Um, we did, we survived this year because of the generosity of our, of our donors and because of the generosity of the Arts Council. Um, uh, but without question, our digital engagement, the continued presence that we had, uh, was a key part of being able to do that. The second thing which was really interesting, 33% of the audience was aged 35 and under. Um, I think overall, 60% of the audience was international. 40% uh, of that was in the US. And we could see this again, going back to finances and business models, starting to impact our fundraising. And we were raising more money in the US. Um, but the younger audience was really exciting and really interesting. And it's probably the reason we're going to make sure we continue this with significance uh, to, to a significant amount um, in the next two seasons. Um, so as well as the full firm, as I said, we still did the social insights on social media. Uh, we have the LPO moments, the small segments of, of the concerts that we can use and utilize in, in many different ways. Um, we did different things as well. So it's not just about the film concerts. We, we introduced podcasts and some really great chats uh, with, with the musicians and musicians from other orchestras about uh, what life has been like now, but what was like was like just being in an orchestra more generally. Um, and I just wanted to mention Lean In and Listen, another really great opportunity. So in the middle, uh, towards the start of COVID, two, three months in, when everybody was starting to struggle, everyone was worrying about their well-being and their mental health. We teamed up with a, a PR agency to introduce it to a lot of social media influencers. Uh, so people like uh, Russell Brand, Fern Cotton, uh, would uh, pick a piece and post it on their social. And we reached millions of people who would not naturally engage with orchestral music. Uh, to talk about music and how it can help people uh, and their mental health, particularly during this period through COVID. We also use digital for a different way. And it, it was really glad to hear Ben talking about it was, it's got to be cross uh, organizational. So our, like most organizations, we have a really fantastic education and community team. And we continued with uh, online music making as well as just the, the push of performance. So uh, working with, uh, we work with various care homes and over the years we've, we've created specific instruments for the participants there and ran workshops. And we still kept doing that. If you imagine again, during lockdown, certainly in the UK for many, many months, these people couldn't see their families and they were having such a hard life that actually the, the weekly session with our musicians, our animateurs was a real break uh, in the things. It's the same for families that were homeschooling with children with special educational needs. Uh, and again, I, we've had such fantastic feedback from the families and parents that the lifeline of having that connection with the orchestra and our musicians on a on a weekly basis on effectively just Zoom sessions. Um, and again, uh, the next generation, I fear so much of, of how this may affect the, the next generation of musicians coming through. It's really it's been a really hard year for freelance musicians, particularly. Um, so again, we made sure we kept engaging with all our development programs, with, with our post-conservatoire, with our uh, sessions for, for people who are under communities that are underrepresented in the orchestra. And they had lessons, they had seminars on how to, how to use social media and digital and all of these things. So using this is a great opportunity to keep developing. So I think we have questions at the end, but just a few little thoughts from me in terms of looking forward. So we've been having lots of conversations about hybrid filming. As I said, our, our, the quality of what we did was aimed 
and targeted around a specific period of time when we had an empty hall. Uh, going forward, we can't like like this. It, it would de it's distracting in the audience. He says being the one person who was sat in there listening. Um, but actually, we had our first hybrid concert last weekend. We had Karina Kalalakis, uh, and we filmed with uh, with an audience and did lighting, but in a different way. Lots of whites and lights, so it wasn't distracting. It worked really well. I think hybrid filming is going to be a lot easier than we thought it might be. Income generation. I, I explained how we had the model with with Marquee. Um, but this isn't a golden bullet for, for raising lots of money. Uh, I think um, the, we looked at pay-per-view, we looked at uh, just offering for free. We feel that there should be a value to certainly the full length concerts, uh, a financial value, uh, but it's a challenge. And the same way with streaming, we have, we have something like 160 million streams a year, but it's not exactly producing a lot of income for the orchestra. Um, so that model needs to be looked at. Obviously, the creation of this level does cost, um, which comes to sort of how we value experience, how we prioritize our, our work and investments, the monies we spent creating this digitally as opposed to what we spend live. Uh, everything is finite, sadly. Um, but I think what's been really interesting is that we've sort of proved concept. We've proven that there isn't a significant international and younger audience that want to engage with the orchestra through these digital ways. And whether that's the full length concerts or the social media um, or the podcasts or the streaming, and so it's working out where that sits with each or within each organization in terms of how we prioritize uh, the work that we do. Uh, which sort of leads to platform distribution. And, and again, uh, uh, not just copying Ben's presentation, but as he said, this thing is evolving all the time. We just started TikTok in the last couple of months. And we've seen the numbers can grow overnight with the right posts. Uh, who knows what the next level of social media will be the next alternative way of distribution we're all watching this really carefully as we come out of covid and live performance comes back again it'll be interesting to see where audiences go and how where they sort of sit and what they stick to and that's that's my presentation for now thank you david and especially thank you for making a social media a better place to be i think your ideas are really interesting and i hope that we can share them among our viewers today and maybe they can take some of our advices or ideas one question that i have uh, watching a presentation that means actually you need to have a really good equipment to work like cameras etc or you can do it and be creative and, and go without them i i think you can use both um, I think for the full length concert, if you're asking to people to pay, I think it's got to be high production values. But a lot of our stuff on social, the, the, the interviews, the conversations were done for free. I'd suggest everyone look at uh, some of the work of the um, Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment. They've done all of that in-house where they bought two cameras, uh, trained their staff to use them. And they, there's some really beautiful work being done. So it doesn't have to be done at the highest cost end. Um, and actually, even ours, we've been very careful. I think we've only got four cameras on the, on the film you just saw there. Uh, I, I, you can use, I know some people use up to 10. So it's, we've been really tight with how we've managed the budget and how we've managed the money. Uh, but you can, you can do it in, in, in many different ways. It's about engagement and the audience you're talking to and what they're used to watching and how you want to present yourself. Thank you. Thank you. But I think it's also a good investment uh, in the end we see from your experience. Um, thank oh, you, David, yeah. for your presentation and answers. Uh, we have the last speaker of this blog, and that is Johan Magnusson, the director of Swedish Center for Digital Innovation. Johan is a professor of information systems at the University of Gothenburg and director of Swedish Center of Digital Innovation. He is the best to answer the question, how to put the digitalization in our strategies? Johan, hi, I hope you're well and you're ready for presentation. Yes, I am and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, uh, super nice to meet all of you, even though this is a weird format. Uh, we are uh, analog digitalization here, right? So we're basically doing the same thing as we, uh, we ordinarily were doing in face-to-face uh, -face meetings. And that's sort of the, 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 the core um, or the starting point of my uh, short speech here. We have a problem, uh, and that problem is that we have this tendency to basically re regurgitate previous assumptions about what, what, what made us relevant. And this is something that we see across all industries that we study, both the public and the private sector. We are sort of, we are basically like narcissists. We are falling in love with what we once were 
And we think that this is something that we can continue be doing if we can just cut a little bit of the cost. Right. If we can just increase the sort of margin a little bit, if we can just automate. And that is at the very core of this misconception of digitalization. It is different from computerization. Computerization was basically just porting it over into a digital format, right? Turning the analog into the digital. But digital transformation is something different, right? So, so I'll give you some brief glimpses into what we find uh, from our perspective. So I want to start here in Westworld, right? So if you guys have seen the series, then you know that this is all about a future, um, some sort of a, dis, uh, uh, a weird future where uh, we, have, we, we see a company that has automated uh, actors, basically, right? So they spent enormous amount of funds and uh, had an enormous time to market to basically automate actors. From an sort of investment perspective, this is a really bad investment, right? They've spent enormous funds on creating general level AI so that you don't know if you're interacting with an artificial intelligence or not. They've spent an enormous amount of resources and time on developing robotics so that you don't know if this is a robot or if it's a human, right? So from a mere automation perspective, this is a really shitty investment, right? But what does that do? It opens up for innovation, right? It opens up for a new value offering. It opens up for really unethical business where you can basically kill somebody in the theme park if you'd like. So preferably you'll choose a child to kill because they have a lower cost of production, right? In this case, this is a weird example, I know, but it shows you these two sides. And when we study uh, digital strategies, when we study the uh, strategies of organizations like uh, automotive manufacturers, uh, municipalities, um, uh, cultural institutions, we find that there is this tendency to equate digitalization with automation, right? What we know when digitalization hits is that it increases the fluctuation of demand. It dramatically changes the, uh, the, the necessary quality of service and digital services, right? So, so the customer or the user will uh, experience and, and display fluctuations in demand that we need to meet as an organization with increased agility, right? So the more we automate, the less agile we become, the more we pour liquid cement into our organization. So right now, if we look across the board, then we're seeing organizations basically doubling down on what made them relevant in the past through the use of digital technologies, through the use of porting over previous, uh, uh, most uh, often times obsolete processes over into a digital format. This is a fundamental problem, and I'll explain why. And um, so if we... If we turn our attention to another example, uh, most of you guys know IKEA, right? I had the privilege of uh, 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 conducting an executive education at IKEA right the day before Ingvar Kamprat, the founder, died. So he had previously been there uh, on Wednesday. I was there on a Friday and I died on the Saturday. So, so this is his dying words, or at least in my perception of it. Right. They, would, they were having a kickoff in the executive team, right? So a bunch of people in a room, really happy to meet this 95-year-old gentleman who had founded IKEA, a very successful company, right? And what happened was that, well, he's entering the stage in his wheelchair, and he starts off by just looking people square in the face, right, for five minutes. It's a shitty uh, kickoff. And then after five minutes, he says the following, none of you bastards are going to have a job in six months. And then he pauses again. I don't know. Maybe he was out of breath or something. And then he says the following, Ikea has grown so goddamn good, it will be the death of us. He had understood that what they have been doing is basically putting the operations on repeat, doing the same thing over and over again, right? Growing, expanding, making a lot, a lot of money. But... They had lost out on something. They had lost out on this exploration. They had lost out on making mistakes. They had lost out on doing new things that might seem counterintuitive, but that were basically changing what IKEA was. 
that was something of the past. That was no more. They had been grown so goddamn good, and it would be the death of them, right? And this is a fundamental insight. This is a fundamental insight against sort of the idea of digitalization as automation. We can't simply automate everything. We need to change something. We need to reinvent ourselves. We need to do something new because the audience is changing. Their expectations are changing. So we need to meet that. And to do that, we need to do something different. And that brings us to a second example. And this is an example from James Freeman, who's the CEO of uh, uh, Blue Bottle Coffee. So it started out as James Freeman was a clarinet player in the Bay Area, right? But he wasn't that good. So he didn't see a future uh, for himself, um, a freelancer, right? So, so he wanted to go into business and he decided to go into coffee. And his friends told him that, well, James, come on, you haven't attended a single class at a business school. So what do you know about running a business? And I said, well, I've done my research and most of the people that run the companies into bankruptcy have attended business school, so I should be okay. Right. And then he said, well, but, but you're going into coffee. It's highly competitive and you know nothing about coffee. Well, you know, well, if, since it's highly competitive, there must be a lot of competence out there. So I could ask people. And since I don't know anything about coffee, I might do something new. Right. So what happened was he attracted a lot of venture capital for an artisan roastery chain. Right. So he started this and it grew exponentially. It grew on steroids through all the new capital. But couple of years into this, he uh, visited one of his shops and he noticed that the magic was gone. It was not the company he wanted to found. It was something different. This was like a ripoff of Starbucks or something. It had no soul. So he put everything on pause because he wanted to think. And he arrived at the following conclusion, right? That the magic in his operations or the company that he had thought about was in incompetence and inefficiency. In incompetence lies the ability to do something new, to be creative, to not just follow best practices, to actually invent something, right? And in inefficiency lies the ability to actually execute it, right? Without inefficiency, without free resources, without the slack, there was no possibility of them actually doing something new. So his question became, how do I scale incompetence and inefficiency? And how do I advocate this to my investors? So what we see here is basically the idea that innovation lies in inefficiency. So if you have a truly efficient operation, then you basically have no ground for innovation. You have no possibility to create these variances. So the strive for efficiency through automation is a dead end street, at least if you assume that there is change in the outside environment. And this is another core of what we're talking about here. When digital comes as it has now and as it has been sort of accelerated through uh, the pandemic, then we see two types of, uh, of behaviors emerging. On the one side, we see those that are doubling down on their core operations, seeing the core as the sacred, right? On the other side, we see these organizations that understand that the core is nothing more than an installed base. It is what gave us the relevance in the past, but it is not what's going to make us relevant in the future. So they create separate value offerings on top of it. Right? They start to expand and differentiate. They start to attract uh, uh, partners. They start to move into different industries. And this is at the very core of digitalization or digital transformation, that we need to do these shifts. It is not our past that's going to save us in the future. So, and this is something that we've seen in other companies as well, right? So I'll give you this example as a final one from the, uh, the madness that we call corporate. Um, so this is Nokia CEO, uh, Stefan, when they had basically run the company bust and the shambles were picked up by Microsoft to start to devouring the corpse, right? We didn't do anything wrong. And that's exactly the point. 
There was no creativity. There was no testing out of weird ideas. There was no incompetence. There was no inefficiency in their operations. They were just automating, becoming, uh, um, becoming obsolete. And that is one of the uh, uh, central pieces here. We have a technology here that is really well designed to automate oblivion, right? So, or obsoleteness. So, from this, we'll turn our attention over into, um, into uh, Nietzsche, right? So, the archetypical uh, heretic, a guy who basically killed off God in his work, right? So, this is from Alzus Brach Zarathustra. God is an assumption, but I want your assumption to reach no further than your creative will. When I think about this in the perspective of, for instance, Volvo cars or um, ABB or um, the, 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 the National Opera, etc., I think about it as this tendency we have to assume relevance, to fall in love with our core business, to fall in love with our products, to fall in love with what we basically see as what has made us relevant in the past, and then we continue. So when I meet executives from automotive companies, I tell them, nobody cares about the car. They basically don't care anymore. It's not what you think it is. It's not something they fall in love with. And I speak to people in, 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 in appliances. They don't care about the refrigerator. They want the function, right? The institution is dead. They don't care about the bank. They want the banking service. They don't care about the opera, they want the opera service, right? And this is something different, something entirely different. And it leads us into having to make some pretty dramatic shade changes to the way that we perceive our businesses, the way that we perceive our institutions. So I would recommend you guys, right before we end here, to, to, to be wary. Remember Midas, King Midas, right? The sort of gilding everything around him. It might look sort of attractive at the beginning, but it will not save you in the end. So don't automate the obsolete. Be very wary of over automation. Be very wary of trying to sort of jump on the bandwagon of what these consultants are selling you. Right, that we just need to continue cutting costs and then we'll be, continue to stay alive. Right? Sustainability isn't through cutting costs. It is about staying relevant by offering new value offerings. And seeing this cost cutting as a sole strategy or an isolated strategy. Remember King Solomon. Right? So if you have two executives coming in and one of them accepts you cutting the baby in half, then maybe that's not the executive you should trust. Right, you don't. Uh, weight loss is not sort of uh, uh, weight loss through amputation is not a very good idea, right? For future functionality and falling in love with your core value offering, right? Like Narcissus, just staring into the pond. That's not going to save you. You need to do something different. You need to do it today. And assuming the sustainable relevance over time, like Zarathustra uh, tells us. There is no sustained relevance over time. There is no sustained competitive advantage anymore. It is transient. The core construct of strategic management is basically null, right? So, and that has several implications, but we won't get into those today. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Johan. I was watching the time and when it got zero seconds, you ended. Perfect timing. You have learned this, I uh, think, through this digital technology times of Zooms. <laughs> Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. Um, now it's time for discussion and we have all of our three speakers, Ben, David and Johan. And also we have uh, two present speakers at Hans Esperons and uh, the panelists are joined by Deputy State Secretary, Ministry of Economics of Latvia, Raimonds Alexeyenko. Hello. Um, Sveiki. And also the Deputy State Secretary for Cultural Policy from Ministry of Culture of Latvia, Uldis Zariņš. Hello. Um, 
Having heard the three first speakers, what would I love to ask for uh, Raimonds and all this is how high on the list of priorities currently is digital transformation in Latvia? If you look at our priorities, how, how yes, high I, it is? I can start uh, from Ministry of Economics perspective. Uh, digitalization as a word uh, is clearly the first topic and most important one. But uh, already today I hear uh, that these challenges that we have, it's completely the same what, what uh, speakers already mentioned. It is firstly, it is not mismatch uh, what is digitalization, what for it is. And especially when we are talking about private sector dig digitalization, it's quite simple how we operate. We are giving opportunity for innovate for companies. Uh, but when we start to talk about public sector, uh, where this uh, culture is included too, partly at least, uh, then we are a little bit on the stiff side. We are, we are not clearly uh, innovating. We are uh, digitaliza digitalizing and automatizing and doing automation on our processes, but it's not encouraging innovation, and this is one of the things which uh, we have to bring from this conference, that in public sector too, we have to think about innovation, not so much about probably uh, some increase in efficiency, just as a focus. Thank you. Aldis, maybe you have a comment on this too. Well, for Ministry of Culture, digitization definitely is on the map, but uh, I would say uh, even COVID times learned, uh, taught us to be slightly careful. So, so we proved the concept that uh, the digital cannot replace the, the, the core products of concert, of theater. So it just, it, it's a surrogate in a digital format. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't go that way. We believe that digitization can add a lot of value, but it has to add value. It cannot devalue it, the, the cultural product. And of course, it can make uh, cultural processes more efficient, more in innovative. But, but in the end, it's a tool. So digitization is a very uh, break, groundbreaking and, and, and uh, the tool that changes society just in a way that, uh, that steam or electricity did before that or printing press. But in the end, it's a tool. You have to use it on your behalf. So you have to use it right. You have to use uh, the right tools. And it certainly helps. But, but as with all tools, you have to know what to do with it. Um, thank you. Um, in the speech, uh, Zane Chokstein mentioned that uh, we know that uh, culture and creative industries were hit really hard during the pandemics. So accelerated the technologies uh, growing and, you know, accepting them at least for seven years. And uh, many European Union um, researchers show that culture needs to be digitalized. It has to you know, not only the, the public, uh, not only the private sector, but also the public sector has to grow with it. Otherwise, the culture, you know, the, the fair has already been hit so hard. If we don't digitalize, it could be that, you know, culture is hit even more harder. Uh, but there, were, there was uh, one question from the viewer, and it was, maybe the speakers can answer this question. When do you know when your organization is mature enough to digitalize? When do you know it? When if maybe when you have a team or you're ready to come up with ideas, to cooperate, when do you know when you're ready? Anyone of you can answer. I, I, I'll start. Um, um, I think today, uh, as Johan was saying, you've got to experiment and try. Uh, and the beauty is you can try stuff relatively low level off the radar, and if it's good, it will get picked up and run. So uh, you can do it with minimal investment minimum time and just try things even if it's just chat on social media um so i would start now and the way is just how you can evolve that and, and keep evolving that thank you johan you raised your hand you wanted to comment on this too yeah 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 i'm, I'm, I'm in total agreement there that well now is the time right and you do it through these small steps you do it through experimentation and through learning and being structured in the way that you approach this it's not about these there is something inherently wrong with the idea or the notion of digital transformation it's not about transforming from a pre-digital to a post-digital or a digital state i mean these these operating models will coexist over it in eternity i believe we will have both right but 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 there is this there is this really uh, uh, 
terrible situation where uh, we have a fear of cannibalizing on the existing operations. We have a fear of sort of wanting to shield and protect what, 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 it, what we believe to be the core. And, and I think it was Steve Jobs who said that, well, if we don't cannibalize, somebody else will. Right. So, so, so if you if you find yourself in a situation where you might want to experiment with cannibalization, then go ahead. Hmm. Um, then, uh, you know, I think th many of uh, us watching and, and you're seeing all this amazing change in London, in London Philharmonic Orchestra, but how to actually start this transformation? What are the first baby steps to take? Maybe you can suggest from your experience. Ben, maybe you can answer this question. Um, I'd argue you you've probably already taken those baby steps. You, you're already using technology. We we all are. Um, there's my phone. There's my you know. So 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 it's it's we're already there. Um, uh, I guess it just depends how far you want to go. You know, uh, um, and and I come back to the fact that what you do should sit under your mission, vision, and purpose. That that should everything you do should should really serve that and fit within that. And then I think those baby steps. It goes to everything that was just being said about experimentation. What do you want to do? Why do you want to do it? Who's it for? Those are the questions you need to ask yourself first, and and then from there experiment and find ways to experiment that do not cause you huge huge risks uh you don't want to jump in there by live streaming a whole concert that's going to cost you hundreds of thousands of pounds or or whatever um f f find ways to do it are, are there people there who want that service who want that value uh so it's it's a i think I mean, we can talk about innovation methodology for, for for ages but but i think it's about starting small uh experiment and then if it works scale it up Yes. And, and uh, utilize Johann? the data. Yeah. yeah. Utilize the data. I mean, what we've sort of, we have this conception of them uh, or the audience being customers to some extent, right? And a customer is somebody who you transfer value to, right? You create it internally and then you transfer it over. The, 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 the cultural uh, uh, sector is much better at understanding that, well, this is a matter of co-production, right? That, that they're actually part of creating this experience. Right? As we shift over into digital formats, then we have a fantastic source of data, right? So, so the companies that actually succeed in this, they utilize that data. They don't try to sort of avoid using it. They actually, they actually highly utilize it. So, 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 so if I would sort of offer one sort of um, um, uh, humble recommendation, it would be to make an inventory of the data that you have, make an inventory of the way that data is created and try to utilize that to, to, to Im improve the quality of your services and find new services. Thank you, Johan. David, please. Some practical. The first thing our digital creative did when he, he joined was just go and hang around at rehearsal. And it was partly so the players got used to him and were comfortable with him and comfortable with the camera being around but also to get to know them. And a lot of the ideas for our first uh, little short films and things came from the players. Uh, similarly, when we first hit COVID, the first thing we did was just have a giant staff meeting and ask people what ideas people had of what we could use for content. And often it's the younger members of staff who are using, certainly using social a lot more uh, frequently than I do, um, who came up with brilliant ideas because they've seen what other people are doing and, and know the company just as well. So I think just talking to people and bringing everyone into that conversation internally as well is, is a really useful start that we found. Can, can, I, just, can I just add to, to what David said there? That, that point about asking the whole organization to contribute to this process is really important. And I think this goes back to the point I was making about leadership, that the, the leaders do not have to be the digital experts. And actually, your board or your chief executive is probably the last person that knows about what the latest trends are in social media, what platforms people are looking at, and how best to, to use those platforms. Actually, probably that comes from the more junior members of staff, the younger members of staff and your organization. So again, from leadership to organizational culture, how can you create an organizational culture that allows those voices to come through? Thank you. 
you already mentioned that in your presentation. I really wrote it down to sum up in the end as well. But uh, we have a question for Johan, uh, and the viewer is asking, can you name any example where an organization or brand has stayed relevant by not sticking to their old core values? A tricky question. Um, yeah, yeah, it is a tricky question. I'll, I'll, I'll mention Twitter, for instance. Right? So Twitter has dramatically changed. It started out as a podcast platform, right? and then it changed, and then it um, pivoted and pivoted and pivoted. So, 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 so they have a, 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 a what do you mean? Uh, they, they have sort of, uh, they assume that there is no stability in the core, right? And that makes it a very difficult company to manage since, since you're basically inviting chaos into the equation. Right? But at the same time, they've managed to succeed in it. So, so, so that would be one example. Um, but, but, but I wanted to follow up on, on, on something that the, the guys here uh, uh, spoke about, and that's sort of, I think we have an opportunity here that we might lose out on, right? So, 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 so never waste a good crisis, right? We've had this crisis uh, at our doorstep or, or in, our, in our living room now for, for quite some time, and that we see tendencies for organizations to revert into the old ways of doing operations when the crisis uh, uh, starts, to, to, starts to go away. I think that would be a, a terrible mistake. I think we need to learn from this. We've, we've been forced to experiment now and we need to learn from it. And we need to continue working with these things even after the pandemic. So, so necessity is the mother of invention, but uh, we have this tendency to revert to our old ways. Thank you, Johan. Can I can I add of because course, this yes. is I think that it is controversial. It is in contrast. It is quite easy question in a sense because I can imagine any living company now, which uh, there is only two options: whether they had a very visionary uh, core value or they have changed. And Nokia, at the uh, strong point, was this one of the companies which had just reinvested. They dropped. They really dropped at 70s and 80s everything, what, what was the core, and made them digital and then uh, electronics and everything else. So I would think that it's, it's different. It's every company which is alive now is in some stage have dropped the core value, uh, or somebody else ate the core business, like what is happening now with, with, with the industry of um, car building and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, we have a government representatives here, and uh, I would like to ask the journalist what government support is needed to help arts organization in this process. You mentioned it's really important that many parts are involved. I think it's both individuals, the public sector, governmental sector, it's experts. What is ideally that government can do to help the digital transformation for, um, of art organizations? Anyone can answer this. I would probably start with uh, what was in the first presentation. So it's understanding, helping people understand. So, so why digital transformation? How digital transformation? Uh, not just, you know, automatically throw money at it. Uh, I happened to be some time ago a member of board of Europeana Digital Library. So there we saw a lot of examples. There was a lot of public money uh, for digitization of cultural heritage. And uh, so it happened that, uh, well, organizations, memory organizations, use this opportunity, just spend money for digitization, put their uh, collections out there in digital, and then forgot about it because it wasn't part of the core mission. So it was just an opportunity to get some money to do something. So uh, I think going back to the, this, this framework we were presented with in the first presentation, I, I believe the most integral part is integration. A step so first you map out and then I figure out where you are and what you should do but unless the digitization becomes part of your core so so at, at some point you don't even uh, recognize you don't have a, a separate digital strategy maybe you you have to have one at start, but, but at some point it has to become a core of your operations. So you shouldn't have digital operations and core operations. So, so this is something because, well, we just cannot throw as, a, as government money at digitization strategy or digitization uh, activities. We have to help understand sector how they can benefit from digitization, how it can become part of their core operations. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Do you have any comments on this? Yes, yeah, sure, Johan. Johan first and then David. <laughs> Uh, I think that uh, uh, what we're seeing in Sweden is a, a, a significant uh, mistake from the government that they do not provide the digital infrastructure necessary for uh, the cultural or, or, or the arts or, or, or anything uh, in that instance. It, it is basically uh, a, a disintegration of what could be a very cost efficient and uh, highly innovative uh, digital infrastructure. So, so, so I think that's one of the roles in which the government can play a, a, a more, more uh, important role. Uh, the other one is through, through, through their uh, the governance, right, through the corporate governance, they are often in a position of uh, having representatives of the boards in these organizations. And there, I think that they should strive for uh, uh, KPIs in terms of turnover or value offerings, for instance, new value streams, new value uh, producing opportunities. Uh, that is something that I would push on the corporate governance uh, level uh, for, for these organizations. Thank you. David? Yeah, I, I, uh, I agree with that. I, I, one of the best conversations I've had over the last few months was with our board when they sort of said, um, they recognize that things evolve and we have to evolve evolve with them and they they certainly would hate to uh to go back to just the way it was which i, I thought was really reassuring so i think any 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 government support on, on boards have to just be very supportive and encouraging um and the other thing going back to what you had said is about um risk i uh i think we've done a lot of this in this period because we we, we could we had to there was no alternative um in a normal world we every single penny is considered every single action is considered and um i've been trying to encourage to put a bit of budget away for risk i know is it nike spend 10 percent of their marketing budget is for just experimentation it really doesn't matter if it fails uh and in the arts where everything is so carefully managed um that's that's a really difficult stage so again i think any encouragement to put some budget aside for experimentation and risk that doesn't feel as though it's taking away from what we would normally do, I think is, it would be really helpful. Thank you. Uh, actually, we have a question from Slido. Uh, do any of the speakers have any fail stories to share as well, where there are digital means or tools that did not meet their expectations? Ben, you were laughing. I think you want to answer this question. Do you know any? Uh, no, no. <laughs> not really, um, um, because I think Grant making software is a is an interesting it's an interesting uh, piece of software as as David will well know. Um, I think now a, a more serious story. Um, an organisation I work closely uh, down on the south coast is is actually Glyndebourne, and uh, Glyndebourne uh, I think are really interesting. Watching their digital strategy develop, uh, they started from a place where they thought that if they started capturing all of their operas, they would be able to very quickly make a lot of money from doing so. Uh, they didn't. It took them about seven years to actually start to break even from that initial investment. However, the value actually for them wasn't just financial, it was their ability once they'd captured their operas to use that material in many different ways. So it was, yes, they turned it into CDs and DVDs. It didn't generate the income they expected, but it gave them all kinds of material for marketing, for their education work, even for their artists to use as part of their promotional material. So uh, the, yes, it failed in terms of expectations, but it succeeded in many other ways. Actually, I was about to ask uh, how to convince sponsors and government that investment uh, in culture when it comes to technologies is a, a, in the long term, it's actually you get benefits. You know, you just mentioned this example. And I think uh, I'm working for Latvian television. Uh, it's been there for 60 years and we have a huge archive, which is our actually biggest benefit. We can use archive like BBC, you know, for all the movies and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. We never thought that it could be our maybe biggest value in the end. Um, so my question is how to convince you know, sponsors, anyone else that investment in this digital transformation is an invest, uh, actual investment and benefit in the long run. Yeah, David. Again, it goes back to being clear what your core mission is, why you're trying to do this and how it fits into your mission um, is the first point. So for us, 
saying it's about sharing our music, it's really clear to say if we want to share our music, we reach millions of people over over pandemic that we would not have reached otherwise. That's a really clear one. Um, I think it's um, it's also just again taking them on that journey uh, from a, a government civic pride side, from a brand awareness side. The, the profile we've got from this is, is is unrecognizable. So there should be relatively easy arguments. Thank I'll you. follow up on that inclusivity and democratization. Right. That's that's what this can uh, can lead to. Thanks. Um, there is a question. I assume it's for government representatives. Which art sector has been the most successful so far in digital transformation? And can you mention any examples? From, from Latvia, maybe? I know one in Liepāja, for example, from the news. <laughs> I see. Uh, from uh, economically, uh, clearly, first, what the what, um, service sector clearly have, uh, and especially ICT as a f first runner. But uh, mostly, when we look at Latvia, it's too small to have uh, sectoral uh, champions. I would say that uh, the nice thing about such small economy is that uh, we can choose champions from any field. Like uh, it's quite often uh, in Latvia, we, we we can say that there is some fields of research which is very good, like mathematics, like uh, ICT, like uh, like uh, solid state materials. But then and everybody returns back that, and but we need as nationally we need national language research because it's not commercial. We have to spend fun, finance it. Uh, but at the end. Uh, language technologies is one of the champion technologies in digitalization, which which we can we can show uh, from Latvian side, which which have moved very fast and and specifically for small languages. So I would say that this is not a sectoral issue. Uh, we can pick uh, persons, we can pick uh, companies which have succeeded very good at the digitalization, and it's it, it doesn't matter whether it's public sector or private sector, like Latvian forest uh, sector, Latvian forest management company. Now, one of the largest product for them is digital services for uh, management of forests. Uh, they are moving closer and closer to actual their core business. Uh, value and so so we can choose. Uh, I think that it, it's easier to choose champions in in the fields and the sectors. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree about this language thing. It's true, true. Yes, all well, as, as for culture, so it's it's, it's tricky because culture is well uh, a kind of catchphrase for many different sectors, and it's a bit like comparing oranges and apples. So, uh, cultural heritage in, uh, institutions, uh, archives, museums, libraries have historically been on the forefront in digitization uh, in culture. For performing arts, it hasn't been so much on the map before COVID, but. Uh, uh, and I can really uh, tell that I was so impressed by, by some of the examples uh, during COVID uh, shown by small independent theaters here in Latvia. Going, you know, just just bad shit with, with, with experimentation, doing Zoom uh, um, performances and, and, and all kinds of strange formats, which didn't always work. So it certainly didn't work out financially, but, but it was very interesting to witness how, how quickly they were able to pivot and then try to find new, new forms for expression. So that was really wonderful. Mm. Thank you. Um, there's another question on Slido. What about the digital skills? Do organizations have sufficient skills? Does the audience? Yes, Johan. Yeah, the audience asked them. Yeah, the organizations don't. Right? So, so we recently did an analysis of all the uh, uh, job postings in Sweden from 2006 to 2020 using natural language recognition technology. So, so, so we basically crunched through all of them. And we saw a dramatic increase in, in the way in, in the demand for digital competence. It, it has doubled over since 2006. But in some sectors, it has sort of de started to decrease from 2016, like in healthcare. Right? So healthcare is no longer increasing its demand for digital competence, which is a uh, fundamental problem. Uh, but uh, but I would urge uh, I would urge uh, all organizations to use the Eurocomp uh, 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 framework, which is super easy to use, and you can analyze your own job postings and the CVs of your uh, uh, of your associates to see oh what's the level of digital competence here. Is there any other comment from Ben or David? Yeah, Ben. I would just I would add, just to, add that. to that. 
don't silo digital skills. It goes back to my point about not, not siloing in departments and organizations. Don't silo digital skills. Um, there are more routes to developing skills than just going on a training course. That, that actually this unsiloing across departments in an organization is a, where, a way of sharing skills between people within your organization and peer-to-peer -peer learning. So um, I, think, I think that's something, I think also uh, being aware of the skills, you know, doing some kind of audit within your organization to see where people are. And it's not just about what they can and can't do, it's also about their confidence. How confident are they? Uh, it is, is a really a first question before how skilled are you? Thank you. Uh, David, do you want to mention something? No, I, I think I agree. I think the audience is there uh, in tenfold um, and we're, we're catching up. But I think, you, again, you do, for a small organization, you can bring in freelancers to help on specific projects. You don't have to have all the skills in-house all the time. Um, and it's a matter of just picking up the level of what you can do in-house and what you need to bring in uh, on specific case-by-case -case projects. Thank you. On this inspiring note that everyone can do anything, we could end the discussion. Thank you so much, Johan, David, Ben, for joining us, for all this and Raimonds being present, finding your time, coming here uh, from your work at the working day. Really appreciate that. I hope uh, you, you all and me and the viewers are inspired from the presentations, from the first block, also from discussion. Um, also, I'm inviting the viewers, please uh, comment, write your comments and questions still on Slido.com. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, also for those uh, who are interested, we are uh, streamed live on Facebook and both on Riga, Jurmal official website. You can watch it there. We have also a translation in Latvian. Now we are ready for the next block in this conference and we know that the digital shift has touched all aspects of human activity and culture is no exception the culture assets and works has been digitized and digital technology has become a tool for novel creations digital born works have enriched the resources available to those interested in culture uh, especially now during the COVID times and technology has huge potential to facilitate and as we just heard in the discussion democratize the cultural processes and resources so the next uh, block is uh, called digital transformation of artistic creation and i have a person on the stage uh, from latvia here present it's uh, right schmitz and he's the first one that comes in my mind when i think about creating content in the digital um, technologies help and uh, this is artist and founding director of Rick's Center for New Media Arts uh, Culture, and he's also a curator of the annual Rick's Day Arts Science Festival, Raitis Schmitz. Um, hello, Raitis. The floor is yours. It's really nice to see you here. Yeah, hello. Uh, thank you for uh, having me. And uh, yes, I have pretty short time. I will start uh, straight away. Uh, let's see where I have my slides. So, uh, as uh, Eva introduced me, so I uh, represent uh, the New Media Arts Center, RICSI. I'm an artist myself. I work very closely in collaboration with my spouse, uh, Rasa Schmeta. And uh, we also uh, curate uh, New Media Art Festival in Riga, uh, which is coming in, the, at the, uh, in September this year. So uh, I'll show you just a couple of projects, so, uh, because it's such a short time. So, and, uh, First, I'd like to start with the quote by Stephen Wilson, uh, who is a very well-known author, and uh, he has published several books about uh, art, technology, and science, uh, where he's pointing out that actually artists uh, who are uh, working with newest technologies, and not just uh, digital technologies as it today, but newest technologies in general, so they are uh, facing the dilemma uh, which, uh, from the one hand, so they are kind of expected to show us uh, the newest possibilities of those technologies uh, and uh, explore those technologies and, and create new art forms uh, out of there, so uh, create new experiences uh, for the audience. And from the other hand, so they actually are asked to stand back, so mainly by uh, uh, tradition, by... Uh, bigger institutions in art world, so to uh, be 
uh, to stand back and be critical uh, on the impacts of these uh, newest technologies. So uh, this is the dilemma I've been working uh, for like uh, last uh, 25 years uh, uh, in my life. And uh, just to go further, so I'd like to agree with uh, Peter Weibel, who is actually uh, quoting Sarah uh, and saying that uh, it is just a proper and it is just a normal so that uh, actually uh, artists representing their own time are using the means of their own time, so which is digital technologies uh, today. And uh, uh, being more kind of specific, uh, using digital technology, we've been, as a society, we've been using digital technologies, I think, for the last three decades, uh, like most uh, intensively, of course, the uh, last years. So uh, by using those, uh, we are leaving uh, traces, very visible traces of our daily routines, of our uh, uh, habits, of what we are doing, uh, in a form of digital data. So there's a huge question about the digital data uh, realm, so who owns it, uh, what are the rights, what are the uh, ethics uh, of using uh, digital data. Uh, but uh, uh, for artists, digital data has become a sort of a material uh, for creating artworks. And me uh, and Rasa Schmidt have worked with, uh, mainly with scientific data for the uh, last couple of decades. And uh, I will show you the latest work of ourselves, which is called Atmospheric Forest. So uh, this started three years ago uh, with a collaboration project uh, with uh, Swiss uh, scientists from uh, Swiss Federal uh, Science Institute uh, who is researching uh, forest and ecosystems around the forest. And uh, they, in this project, so we use the dates also where the scientists actually are researching one particular area in uh, Swiss Alps, in Finnwald, so which is suffering from drought. And uh, this, uh, so this is a kind of the forest in, in, in Alps, so the scientists have uh, turned into uh, observatory, so where they're observing for a long period of time, for more than one growing season, the behavior of the trees, so how they change uh, because of the climate uh, impact. Uh, atmospheric forest uh, is, is uh, it, it visualizes, it shows actually uh, this complex relations uh, in uh, what we have in our ecosystem and our goal was to create immersive experience for the audience and uh, to experience uh, not really the visible part of the ecosystem where trees in that particular region, so how the trees are emitting the volatile emissions, how the trees are emitting uh, what we, uh, what we uh, know as a scent of the forest, so how that changes because of the climate, how that changes during the uh, growing season. And uh, here, uh, yeah, going more specifically into this artwork, uh, firstly, I'd, I'd like to admit that it is, uh, can be experienced for those who are in Riga. It is exhibited uh, at the Purvitis Prize exhibition in National Museum of Arts. And it is, as you see here, it's a uh, two-channel uh, video uh, projection. But uh, the initial uh, format of the artwork was uh, virtual reality. And uh, just because of the COVID, so we were not uh, really allowed to uh, show the virtual reality work. So because of the face mask and, and with, with the, you have to use the goggles and, and put it on, on, on your uh, face. So it's, it's uh, yeah, uh, the museum didn't want to show it. But uh, going to the topic of uh, digital technologies, I would like to admit so that mm, probably in arts uh, there is a unique possibility that you can transform the same project, the same artworks uh, in various forms. So we are dealing uh, not with the fixed image, we are dealing with data and we are dealing with generative systems. Uh, digital generative systems. And because of that, so we can transform this uh, artwork 
uh, in several ways. So first, it was uh, exhibited last year in an exhibition called Critical Zones in ZKM in Karlsruhe. And because of COVID situation, so they didn't open the exhibition in last May uh, in a museum. Instead, so the, the first opening was virtual exhibition. And for the virtual exhibition, we were asked to uh, change the format for this work. So, and we actually created 360 video, uh, which can be experienced also uh, today uh, on your uh, devices, on the cell phones or, or a computer. And uh, it is available from uh, Critical Zone's website. So, at the same time, we worked on uh, virtual reality uh, format and also on uh, dual channel uh, video format, so, which is exhibited also at the ZKM uh, Museum at the moment. So, uh, a little bit stepping back from uh, digital data, uh, actually, uh, in this particular work, uh, we were keen to show the actual material. We were keen also as an artist to put our hands on the actual material and to work with the actual material, which is resin uh, in this case. So we uh, melted the resin, we distilled uh, the turpentine from the resin and it is uh, showed in the vitrine box as you here see in, in uh, those images. So uh, as, a, as a real material, so where actually this immersive experience and the data are coming from. So altogether there are uh, six uh, data sets uh, presented in this work. Uh, the main is uh, resin pressure and volatile emissions of the trees. So then there is also uh, the day-night uh, time and then there is a temperature of the air and humidity of the air and uh, also humidity of the soil. So all that complex uh, data set is used as a material uh, for this artwork and uh, this experience uh, changes, it is not a recorded experience, so it, it uses, it, it's generated live, so it uses the data sheet, which is uh, from one growing season uh, from the Swiss Alps, and so whenever you go uh, and experience the exhibition, so actually the emissions, the, the moves of particles, uh, those are generated uh, in live. So, uh, yeah, this is a slide from an from exhibition website of ZKM, where you, can exhibit, where you can experience the online artwork. And kind of to one hand, of course it compromises the quality because of the internet format, but on the other hand, it also uh, widens the possibility of uh, presenting this work, so people who uh, cannot uh, visit the exhibitions uh, either in Riga or in Karlsruhe, so they still can experience the artwork online. Uh, so, therefore, we, uh, I'll jump to the next project, so which is uh, actually related with our art center, RICC. And last year, so we created a website uh, called immersiverixi.org, uh, where we have several sections uh, showing the virtual uh, tours or vir virtual uh, exhibitions uh, created by uh, various artists in our gallery, or uh, we are also showing the documentation, three, mainly in 360 uh, video format, of our festival exhibitions. So, there are many, uh, like, I would say, yeah, yeah, opinions about uh, how to create and what to do with the digital formats, and I think, hope it will be the topic of our discussion after my presentation, so I will not go very deep into this, but uh, what I'd like from this project also to uh, show is that uh, we kind of went back in the history, and as I said, we started to work with digital technologies already in the 90s, 
Uh, in the 90s, uh, there was a, a internet art and uh, net art, uh, which was a new art form using, uh, like one of the first art forms using these uh, network digital technologies. And also here in Latvia, we have uh, collected uh, and curated several uh, internet artworks, so therefore we kind of uh, went back also in history and we started to create uh, the net art anthology which uh, has several artworks uh, at the moment five uh, which are partially restored and can be experienced also from uh, immersive rixi website so there's a huge question about uh, longevity of the digital artworks and uh, I'm pretty skeptical about it because I've experienced uh, loss of many artworks since uh, late 80s, since the beginning of 90s, starting with the CD-ROMs, then going into the websites, especially those created with Adobe uh, Flash technology, and so on and so on. So, uh, yes, so that's another big topic, uh, how to preserve these artworks, and that's why also today, uh, I see there's a kind of uh, the museum, the art system, the collectors are still kind of holding back and not really uh, jumping into the uh, digital art. So because of uh, these questions, also because of these questions of the uh, longevity of digital artworks of the preservation of the artwork. So there are several attempts. One of them is uh, emulation, which is uh, technically uh, very advanced and quite expensive. But uh, then there is uh, another very, uh, how to say, radical approach uh, about reinterpretation the artwork, so which uh, mainly is borrowed from the uh, theater, so uh, the director actually reinterprets, reinterprets the play every time he stages it. So this could be in a certain way maybe applied also to the artworks. Uh, then there are attempts where just collectors, not the museums, large museums are collecting uh, along with the artworks, they are also collecting the spare parts of the technology and equipment. Uh, which again is a very complex and uh, expensive approach. So there is no, what I'm saying, there is no really uh, one answer to this uh, problem. And uh, this is still, I think, with the development of digital technologies, this will just expand. So, uh, yeah, there's another slide from a website. So we actually recorded uh, videos from those uh, flash-based artworks. Uh, that at least you can experience one way of uh, uh, one way of uh, experiencing these these artworks in a form of video. So I think yeah, I'm I've run out of time. So this was all I wanted to say in very uh, quick manner. So thank you very much. Thank you, Wright, this uh, Schmitz, for your presentation, telling about Rikste and your own work. Uh, I had a question. Uh, we shared experience from uh, orchestras abroad, where they told how they tried to, to you know, adapt the situation now uh, during the COVID-19 crisis, when the culture was really hit hard. What about uh, digital artists? Did it affect you personally? And you see the field, I mean, also internationally. Was it, did it change a lot for digital artists, or was it re real time to thrive? Uh, yes, it, it did, of course. It changed in a way that uh, we have uh, less opportunities to exhibit our works in a physical space, uh, which is a shame. But uh, on the other hand, also, it created lots of opportunities for uh, exploring new formats, uh, new online formats, new, new digital formats. Uh, but, uh, yeah, those formats have uh, big limitations, as I said. So, first of all, so if we talk about uh, online artworks, so that's a very specific format, and you have to learn how to uh, work with it. So, you have to learn uh, new web technologies. 
and uh, otherwise it's it's yeah it it uh, comp compromises so the quality you can't it's not so easy just to transform the existing artwork uh, from a physical space to the digital so it's it's just a documentation so i'd say Thank you, right? Uh, I hope you stay here longer for a discussion later. But now we have our next speakers here, and uh, it's interesting because they are two. It's Daniel Hengst and Clemens Scholl. They both are co-creators and curators of the project in We Are, We Trust. So I think for them, maybe the space is not really the problem. I, well, they will tell us more. Um, so, the, and they both are um, media artists living in Berlin, met in 2019. Uh, in the VR residency program, Creative Places. Daniel Hengst has been creating works in virtual reality, video and sound installations and performances, artistic research and web projects. Um, Clemens Chol, uh, artworks are experiments that question current relationships between technology and society. Hello, I hope you feel well. Greetings from Riga. And uh, the floor is yours to present your presentation. In VR, we trust. Thank you very much for this very exciting um, introduction. Thank you so much for having us in the conference. Uh, we are very happy to be here with you. Uh, and uh, thank you for your interest in our project in VR We Trust uh, that had recently its opening uh, in May 2021 of this year. Um, and I will just for the overview for you, I will talk a bit uh, in the beginning about uh, the start of the project and the fundamental or some of the fundamental ideas behind the project. And then Clemens is going on with more details regarding the digital aspects and the transformation of the project towards an online project. Um, we started to work on the project in March 2020. Uh, Clemens asked me in that time if I want to join his uh, project or his idea of creating an exhibition around uh, virtual reality, because what we wanted to do then uh, was to critically investigate um, art in, with or through virtual reality after this first, first big hype that took place in the mid of the 2010s. Um, so now I have to check the clicker if it's working. Um, sorry. So hopefully, yeah, that works. Um, amazing. Some of you may also know that VR and art in VR uh, is not really new. Uh, so this is a very old technology. It was already there as an art piece in the 90s, but you can also trace back lines until uh, the 60s, late 60s and 70s. So there were the first attempts of uh, being creative with virtual reality technologies. But through the new advent of a new, new consumer technology in the 2010s, there was a real big hype of VR that came up in that time. And that was also like um, influencing the museums, uh, the exhibitions and so on and so on. And this is what we wanted to investigate. We wanted to ask what can we expect from art in VR or through VR? And how can we speak about this art uh, in virtual reality? And how do we want to speak about this art? We also were interested in the role of this highly monopolized market of the tools to create VR experiences. Uh, how are sensation altered through this technology and how is the perception of our bodies, for example, or of spatial um, experiences changed? Um, as one of the first steps in our process, we already created a website uh, as a platform for discourse um, that should accompany our process uh, towards the exhibition process or towards the exhibition. We made interview with artists, with curators working in the field and also scientists that are relating their work uh, to virtual reality or researching virtual, virtual reality. In a second step, we wanted or we started to search in an open call for uh, four VR works that we wanted to exhibit at NRW Forum in Düsseldorf, and uh, which is a museum uh, in North Rhine-Westphalia, and at the Noodle Insights, which is a more a temporal space dedicated to VR art, AR art, and technology. And each of these exhibitions should run for four days. And every day, we wanted to show one work uh, of these four works and discuss this with artists, with experts, and with the community that would be visiting these exhibitions. So we had a very uh, discursive uh, room there and discussing uh, these artworks after watching these artworks or experience these artworks. This was the idea. 
open, our open call was hosted on um, uh, Next Museum IO, which is a, a platform for experimenting with co-curation and co-creation. Uh, we, uh, uh, we arrived, or um, um, 70 entries arrived us uh, uh, after this uh, open call period. And Clemens and me, we decided uh, then on a short list of 10 works that we discussed for one month with our five co-curators that we found also through this platform in a second call that we made there. Uh, so we had this kind of um, uh, second process of uh, uh, curating to go, trying to curating also together with other people through the internet already, um, but uh, still for the, for the exhibition space at these two places that I mentioned. Um, in, our co uh, in our curation process, we try to focus on what we called aspects of VR uh, or aspects of art in VR. As you can see here, this is a kind of an overview of these, inf of these aspects that we really analytically try to investigate uh, to find a better way of how to talk about it and how to investigate art in VR. So we came up with uh, aspects like intermediation or realism versus abstract uh, um, uh, surfaces, narration, or spatial qualities also. These kind of things we try to investigate and we go, we try to go uh, deeper in that. Uh, in November 2020, Clemens and me decided on the four works uh, that we wanted to exhibit and that gave us the uh, highest possibility to discuss these uh, aspects or uh, uh, as much as possible of these aspects. Um, but then, uh, as we all know, the second wave of Corona changed our plan. Uh, because in February 21, um, we decided to move uh, to an online format uh, for, of our exhibition. As you can see in this chart, um, the first red arrow is indicating the moment of our decision to go online with the project. And the second one is the indicating the moment of the opening of our uh, exhibition. Uh, we show this here because we think uh, it's often overlooked uh, how difficult these decisions uh, were or can be in these situations, especially because many colleagues around us were already at that moment um, thinking or talking about the end of this pandemic situation. And the German state was already starting to relax some of the rules they made up for this second wave. But um, yeah, we didn't trust it in that situation. And we were like really thinking that uh, 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 another wave would come in. Um, and yeah, this was like uh, the right decision at that moment, um, as we can see. But as we know, on visiting online exhibition can be a really horrific experience. Um, and a lot of exhibitions we also uh, um, visited were not so <laughs> delightful. Uh, but even though we found ourselves in this situation very involuntarily, uh, we wanted to take an internet, internet format very seriously. And we wanted to create something very, very special for all the audio, for our audiences. So we started to look up for possibilities to transform our discursive exhibition format into the web and Clemens is now talking a bit or very uh, more into detail into that. Thank you. Thanks for the transfer, Daniel. Um, so yes, um, when we set out to, to think about this online exhibition that we wanted to create, I think one core idea that we really had was how can we transfer the sensation of entering a physical exhibition space, an exhibition that you take serious, that you dedicate your, yourself to, so how can we set up a space at your home? How can we create a space? And even if it's not in a physical sense, maybe, how can we have this conceptual space of an exhibition at your home? How can this be an event? How can this be a happening? And so for us, we, we started we start to think of a journey for people. And the journey would start by people going to a website and kind of booking the exhibition, which means signing up to be delivered one of these cardboards. And next step, you would receive this cardboard by physical mail, it's a physical cardboard. And you would then think about, when do I have time to view this exhibition? You would initiate your exhibition, exhibition view by entering a personal code that was printed on the cardboard on our website, and you would activate your visit. And the first thing you would be greeted on uh, with on our website was the instructions to assemble the cardboard. And so for those of you that don't know, a cardboard is a term for a simple VR viewer that's, as the name suggests, made mostly made of cardboard with two plastic lenses. 
and you can insert your smartphone in the front and then you have a simple VR viewer. And we liked this not only because it was the only possible way for us to transport this to people's homes, because most VR exhibitions are still very much bound to institutions because most people don't have this at home, so space is important there. Um, so we, we wanted to leverage technology that existed, and this saved us these thousands of euros that you would usually spend on each individual VR kit. Um, so we, we very much like this decentral approach. And then once you assemble the cardboard, you're ready to start the exhibition. And um, to, to view the exhibition, we had two websites and two devices. So on your desktop, you would view the, I would call it maybe the guide, and then on your smartphone, you would view the individual pieces. And for the guide, we wanted to, as Daniel said, we had a very, an idea for a very discursive um, situation in the exhibition setting. And so we wanted to transport this. We wanted to make you think about these aspects of VR that we had in mind. We wanted to guide you through this, but we didn't want to explicitly guide you through it. We wanted to just give you input for your thoughts. Your own thoughts should guide you through the exhibition. We wanted this to be, in a sense, participatory meaning that you would create your own path through this network of questions, this network of thoughts that you would explore yourself. And so this wasn't about data gathering, it was about giving you impulses through questions to think about certain aspects and questions of art and VR that we had and wanted to share. And so you can see this is big, and so this is not an exhibition that you just scroll through in your normal online usage. It's something that people dedicate time to from an hour to two hours, two and a half hours, the, the same time amount of time that they would maybe spend in a physical exhibition would now be spent in this online setting. And they would create their own journey through it. And it's not only participatory in that you can create your own journey, it's also participatory in that you can engage with other viewers. So we would here, for example, you can see a free text format where users were, or viewers were discussing one of our questions and they could respond to each other and could see how others in the community think about the, the questions that we pose. But now I've only talked about the guide, what about the pieces themselves, which were very difficult to transform into the online setting. And then we had a dual approach. On one hand, we would think about every possible way to transport these artworks as well as possible to the homes of people. And so we commissioned the artists on one hand to help us transform their works, but we also set out to create a fragmented multimedia transformation. And here you can see depicted one particularly difficult artwork because it had all these installation aspects. And so what we would include is pictures of the exhibition space. We had a video tour. We had text about the artworks. We transformed the original VR work into a stereoscopic video, which would work better with your cardboard. And then, for example, for this physical grass that you can see there, and an aroma dispenser with synthetic smell that would usually be included, we instead told people to go out to collect grass and reproduce the setting at home as best as possible. So this was the, the attempt of transforming the works, but then we also found it very important to openly acknowledge and name the differences between what the physical exhibition would have been and what people see here. And we got the feedback that people really uh, appreciated that they were taken serious and that we could get into this discourse with them of like, how does the online format change this also, but what can you see? So we just tried to get as much possible out of it without going over the differences. And then I mentioned it before, on your smartphone, you also had another website to view the exhibition. And this, so this might seem counterintuitive, why do we need two websites? But the problem there is that cardboards, while in themselves a simple technology, require quite some onboarding. You need to install one or two apps, you need to configure them. We want to make sure that it's technologically accessible. And so we have this elaborate onboarding process that we spent a lot of thought on to make sure that everybody would be with us. We synchronized it between the two devices. There was this easy and good process of not losing people for technological reasons. And this also already points a bit at the difficulties also with this format. And I'm going to show you again the slide that Daniel showed before because what is important to consider here is that when once we thought, well, maybe we have to transition online, we thought there is this point of no return two months before the exhibition opens because that's the amount of time we really need to get all of this built. And um, even these two months were very stressful and it was not enough time. So there's this 
long process of building something for the internet. And it's not something that you can do on the last day before the exhibition once you realize that the lockdown is, lockdown is changing how you have to exhibit. And we were very happy that we thought about this so early on, even though it was still stressful. And another challenge that we also were lucky with is that our main sponsor was very open and understanding for the situation. And not only did they allow us to reallocate most of the funds that we had before for different purposes, but they also gave us additional funding supporting us in this transformation, which is very labor intensive and just requires very different tools and mindsets from building a physical exhibition. So to wrap this up, what is maybe a main learning that I can share with you? And I was looking back at the project. What I feel like is that what we achieved is that the internet can be a great venue to show art. You, it can be a great venue to show serious art. Um, but what has been also previously mentioned, it's not only a serious venue, it's also a venue where you can reach people that you would otherwise maybe not reach, that are not in your physical um, location or that are not in your usual audience. But this comes with the, the, the importance of taking the internet serious, of understanding is it its own medium and create, create something that is very specific for it. But don't take my word for it. Um, you can take your own cardboard. We're out of cardboards, unfortunately, but go to our website and you can just experience it with your own um, cardboard. And we, we hope that you can validate um, if these approaches work for you as well. And we hope that inspires your transformations to the online space. Thank you, Clement. Thank you, Daniel. Perfect timing. I must say, I've tried this uh, cupboard thing. It works. It's really interesting. It's a very, a very exotic experience. Uh, I know the kids love it. Um, but our next speaker is here as well, and it's Ellen Defoe, whose fields of expertise is in signal processing for audio images with a dual profile in both the academic and industrial world. He took care of the audio video digitalization operations of Montreal Jazz Digital Project. I hope he will tell us more about this. Hello, are you here, Ellen? Hello, yes. Hello, uh, the floor is yours. Hello. Thank you, thank you, and uh, I'm really happy, thanks for the, the opportunity of participating to the, the discussion. Uh, I'll, uh, I, I will say a few words about the Montreux Jazz Digital Project from a collection to an innovation platform. Uh, actually, uh, let me, yeah, so, uh, just tuning with my clicker. Uh, so the message, my point today really is to explain how in our case for this project, digitizing the archive of the Montreux Jazz Festival, uh, how research and innovation can help actually preserving, enriching uh, such a cultural heritage. It's really a win-win between uh, universities, academic world, and the curators, uh, the, 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 the heritage. Uh, in the universities, we are so happy to have real world data to work with, especially nowadays with um, all the, the machine learning uh, development. And then all this work, all the innovation uh, comes and as an income for enriching, adding value to the, to, to the archives and, uh, and really promoting and allowing to preserve this for a long time. So uh, maybe you know the Montreux Jazz Festival. It's a festival which was created in 1967. By the way, it happens those days on the Lake of Geneva with a special, because of the COVID, you know, with a special and first time stage on the lake. So just uh, uh, to mention the, the, the festival and we are so lucky that it happens finally this year. The festival was created by a guy who had a vision, Claude Nobs. Uh, he wanted to record the concerts from day one, always in the highest quality, uh, always trying the new prototypes for video audio capture, and then broadcast the festival everywhere in the world through the TV, radio uh, channels. And, and actually it worked well for the Montreux Jazz Festival. 50 years later, uh, as Quincy Jones said, we, we have the most important testimonial to uh, the history of music in jazz, blues, rock, but many other things as well, uh, new styles. Uh, the digitization project started in 2007, 
uh, a, a foundation was created, the Claude Naps Foundation, and the collection, the whole collection, was uh, registered to UNESCO in 2013 in the Memory of the World program. Uh, the archive, just a few numbers, it's about 14,000 tapes in video, audio, uh, and uh, many, many different formats during all the, those 50 years. Uh, and yeah, 11,000 hours of video, 6,000 hours of audio, multi-tracks, which is an incredible treasure actually to have stored all the instruments alone uh, from the festival, many pictures, scores, papers, so really a, a complete collection. The foundation, the Claude Naps Foundation, its vision to make accessible the Montreux Jazz Festival archive to the largest number, of course, taking account of all the constraints uh, for copyrights, and we have to respect the copyrights. I'm here today in the Montreux Jazz Cafe of EPFL, of our university, you see behind me. It's closed because of the COVID, but uh, this is an opportunity to show to the public, and in Switzerland we are happy because we have an exception on author's rights for education and research. And this allows us to show on the campus a maximum number of things, not everything, but still a good amount. So the Montreux Jazz Digital Project was created with those two objectives, digitize and preserve, so operational work, and then innovate and research, uh, starting many, many projects in acoustics, signal processing, neuroscience, design, musicology, museology, uh, really to, to to show this archive and to add value to it through through the new technologies that we we have uh, available today. Uh, when I say that, it means that we had to go from really all the from archiving to innovation. So through all the steps in an archiving project, inventory, creation of a database, digitization, quality control, documentation, storage, and then strategies for long term preservation. And with all that set up, we can valorize, innovate, and use in education and research all, all, the, all this material. You see here, students and specialists, speci uh, yeah, specially trained to do the quality control, the indexing. We need a database which is really supposed to link everything, all the metadata from pictures, uh, the person we see on pictures, to the video, the rights for every song, and this is still a work ongoing, of course, to clean up all the data. But this is really the core, the database, the metadata database is, is really important. Storage, we store everything on several, uh, on two sets of LTO, plus on a big hard drive system uh, that was sponsored to us by uh, uh, first a startup, AmpliData in Belgium, and then Western Digital, uh, who could um, give us the opportunity of doing this live archiving at the festival. It means that we even installed one unit of this storage on the, in, in, on the data center of the convention center in Montreux. It is linked with the two other units which are on the campus. And with that, we can immediately record and ingest the content into the, the storage and then work on it through already in the night, for example, to transcode and get lower quality uh, version of the video, then doing in the morning after all the indexing and then checking the rights in the afternoon, importing everything in the database. And then we can display, as you see here on the iPad, display the, the, the concert from the day before uh, to, together with the archive for the public of the, of the venue in the festival. Uh, so this was the first step. Here, a basic uh, setup to, to show this uh, content to the, in the venue to the public of the festival. And then that's where it comes interesting for, for university, because we can imagine many, many things in research. The first, one of the first projects we had, it was in acoustic. You see here the cubes on the ceiling of this venue at the festival, it was in 2014. Uh, here we can project the sound just on the table where you see the people and they can listen to a special content. And then three meters away, there is another uh, people, another group of people listening to different things. And this is really a, a, an experience which, which is interesting for that kind of uh, venue. Uh, the casino, you know that in Montreux, the first venue, the casino, was uh, burned down actually during the concert of Frank Zappa in 1971. 
and uh, Deep Purple wrote the song Smoke on the Water, why not with acousticians Re rebuild the acoustics of this event and allow the, the, the visitors to look at the concerts with the acoustics of the place. This was another project. Remix the archive in collaboration with a company on the Innovation Park at EPFL, Future Instruments. Uh, since we have the multi-tracks, why not having a touch table uh, to play with all the instruments, be able to mute them or even with a 3D audio system to have them turning around us, placing them locally in space. And here you see this is a DJ uh, in an evening playing with this, uh, this content. And then uh, since we can remix the concert, why not together with the festival? It was done several times at the, the Swiss Cultural Center in Paris. Uh, we, re we remix a concert, but we forget an instrument. And then we invite an artist with the public and the artist will replace the instrument live uh, with in the background, the, the video and the audio running. Recently, VR is of course a, a strong, uh, a strong um, technology to, to try. And it was done from 2016 uh, during the Montreal Jazz Festival. We organized 360 cameras on stage, recording everything. And then people can wear the glasses and be really on stage next to Santana, maybe at two meters, the drummer on the other side and the public in front. And this is a totally new type of experience that we can propose. Uh, even live, it was done live in 2018, just behind the wall of the venue. And it, it was so emotional to, to feel really on stage together with the, with the musicians. The, you see here the booth with, uh, of course, people helping. It was before the COVID, so, it was easier uh, at that time. Many other projects like uh, enhancement of the video, like super resolution. It's important now with the new uh, resolutions we have in imaging to, to transform using machine learning, using models of what is a good image uh, to transform the content in higher quality. So this is typically work for uh, PhD students uh, at EPFL or in partners uh, facilities. Thumbnail generation, we have 50,000 songs for the Montreal Jazz Festival, so we can, uh, we can design a model of what is a beautiful image for a concert on stage and then gener generate that automatically from the, from the collection. The Montreal Jazz Galaxy, uh, here this is a PhD working in art and data visualization. What you see here is uh, a representation of the database for the, the musicians. Every point is a musician. And if two musicians who came to Montreux uh, played together, the two points are linked with a line. And it gives that kind of galaxy where you see on the border uh, the bands who never mixed with any other uh, musician. And at the center, the, the, the galaxy of all the stars who came many, many times. You would have, for example, in yellow, BB uh, King. And why not making that alive afterwards? Uh, we had many uh, projects in design and with architecture as well to prepare platforms for the people to discover the, the, the archives. Here, this was the first cocoon designed by the, the EPFL lab uh, for two people. Then it moved on, with, yeah, I'm sorry, with uh, special interfaces to, to, uh, with recommendation and a nice way of selecting the content. Uh, the second version was bigger for 15 people. It's uh, actually behind me in another room at the Montreux Jazz Cafe. And the Nomad edition that we can, uh, well, with which we can tour actually in the world, uh, an ambassador, we took a car and modified the, the roof and this became a, an immersive place. So a typical example here uh, of um, research in design from one of our labs. Montreux Jazz Luminaries, it's a dome uh, that we built, you can enter, and there are sofa, and that's the place where you can, using a bowl, you can navigate in the network of musicians and select your, your song, your artist. Uh, this one will go to Montreux Jazz China in October. Uh, 8K, new types of capture for the festival here with a lot of optics uh, to get more precise image. And we had Elton John at Montreux a few uh, years be before uh, on a big stadium, and we could zoom 
from a long, uh, uh, far away actually, with this kind of installation to, to even in the dark, uh, to have a very high quality zoom and a lot of, uh, of lights. Light field uh, is coming to be able and zoom really on, on the, the instrument during a concert. All those kind of ideas you see here, a kind of summary. We have much more to come with detecting the solo, the emotion, recognizing automatically the artists, rebuilding the next generation of the archive, mastering the audio, all kinds of ideas that we, we promote now with, the, with our partners. So uh, you see that the, the cons in this concept, the archive became really becomes an infrastructure of research, really a platform for innovation, and not only on, in technology, but as well um, in social and human science, in art, in bioscience. Uh, we had a project, we, we still have, and uh, Montreux Jazz Memories, to gather a second archive, actually, uh, for all the testimonies, all, all the, the all having a trace of what this festival represents for the people in terms of job, in terms of meet, uh, social uh, networks, everything. Open science is important too. We have all the metadata now on uh, wiki uh, data. We build a platform with the Swiss Data Science Center to have a secured platform for the researchers to work on without access really to the media for the questions of rights. And during this festival, we have a team of uh, uh, the School of Art in Switzerland, in Valis, uh, organizing a sound choreography of the festival, recording the ambience, the sound ambience in town, uh, and they will do a, a performance then afterwards. And I'll end uh, finally with uh, uh, the future of storage. For example, you know that hard drives is a solution that can be, become problematic in some years with all the data we produce. So why not storing information onto DNA? This is a technology that should still become major, but which is prom promising because it has really uh, no consumption typically, except when you write and when you read, and really a high density and especially a long life, uh, the duration can be several thousand of years. So deep purple, deep purple that we know probably, Deep Purple was the first song that we, we wrote on DNA in 2017. So that's it for this testimony. As I, as I told you, it's, uh, it's a combination between academic and heritage, which is good for funding as well uh, through sponsors. Actually, the pack between innovation and digitization is something which is interesting, even later on for preserving uh, until uh, uh, the, the collection are still, of, of course, in, of interest for, for universities. Thank you, and uh, whenever you come to Lausanne, don't hesitate to come and have a tour at the Montreux Jazz Cafe. You have a few links here. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Alan, for sharing your um, presentation and also inviting us over. Uh, now it's time for discussion, and now uh, we have some people joined us. We have a previous speakers. We have Alan, we have Clemens, uh, we have uh, Daniel, and we also have some people alive here on the stage, present in Hans Esperons, and we have curator of performing arts, Gunde Galaivinje. Hello. Uh, we have a director of the Great Amber Concert Hall, Timur Stomsons. Hello. Hello. We're coming from Liepai this morning. And also Hello. we're having uh, Reit Schmitz from Rikse, who had the first presentation on this block. I will start Hi. with the first question. Can you name a good example where organizations or festivals have created good content using digital possibilities? May I start? Yes, yes. yes of course. Uh, I will be the first because I have this idea in my mind. I was working also in, uh, for some time in Swedish Radio for the Baltic Sea Festival, and uh, and Swedish Radio is of course a public organization, and uh, they transformed very fastly into this kind of digital concert hall format. And but uh, what they did completely differently from the others is they created a digital Don Giovanni opera, and it became really viral and went a lot. And it was specially made not just opera who was transmitted. Digitally, Digitally, but they made it complete digital opera. I mean, using digital technologies and and um, so as, as a product, digital product as, as itself. 
Yes, but it's really, uh, you mentioned me before, that uh, Timur's mentioned me before uh, we started the discussion, it's actually quite easy to digitalize the music, you know, it's actually becoming a recording. But when you start to digitalize theater, what it becomes, is it becoming um, a movie or something else? And I know that I've heard Gonda Galavin saying that in her festival, she, don't, she wouldn't like to have so much digital arts as an ex uh, experience of presence. But maybe you can name some good experiences uh, from COVID times where something was digitalized. Like like I know one from this vacuum cleaner conference, for example, where they talked about mental health. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, I think that the good example is yet to come, I must say. Uh, I think the uh, COVID period was a really good moment to try out things that we in theatre never actually tried before because there was no need. Um, I still hold on view that shared space and time are essential elements in performing arts. However, um, there are so many interesting things emerging thanks to COVID and they will continue uh, definitely, and not only thanks to COVID. Another thing is, which is already longer discussion, that we are so far behind in performing arts uh, in terms of uh, finances, knowledge, if we compare to digital world, like. Mm -hmm production of digital tools, etc., including education. But I think it's really, at the moment, a turning point also in, in, in performing arts. Uh, so let's see what will, how it will develop. Uh, we have actually a question for you, addressed to you in Slido, saying, Gondiga, what has been the most striking experience regarding digitalization and culture that you have witnessed uh, during the last 12 months. It's almost the same question I ask you, but maybe you can remember. Okay, something. I'm super analog myself, but, uh, but what has been the most striking experience was that uh, during the last 12 months, at least in theatre, all of a sudden we all, regardless of our previous status, we were at the very same kind of level, uh, super well-known directors, like superstars and beginners, so we all had to figure out how do we continue making theatre and presenting theatre. So that was really striking to see that actually a lot of well-known directors decided, or companies decided to actually kind of pause and see what's happening while young emerging companies, theatre artists, just were trying everything possible to move on, which was also a question of survival, but it was also a question of attitude, I think. And another thing, of course, was how quickly all of a sudden, because in performing arts we, are, we have used to travel, you know, physically, to be in places, to see art, and to meet people in physical space. And here, all of a sudden, we could meet with people from South America, Africa. You know, it was a question of, you know, other continents. It was a question of just, yeah, the same switching on Zoom and actually creating together immediately. So I think the most striking was actually change of our psychology, how we work together, and what do we need to work together. Thank you. I would like to remind the viewers that you can actually ask the questions on slide.com using the hashtag digi, digiculture, uh, and I will address those questions to the speakers and panelists. Uh, there is a question I can address both to Clemens and Daniel, and also maybe to Wright uh, or Timurs, and the question is, are there any good examples for using VR in classical music? To be honest, I don't know. <laughs> maybe some of you do. Timurs, have you seen a concert, in a concert of classical music with VR? Concert in VR, no, but we in Liepai have a fantastic project when uh, it was a social project when the VR artists um, made um, a beautiful uh, travel tour to Liepai and also including the concert hall uh, with a kind of a, a bit of, of um, a rehearsal with the orchestra and it was brought to the uh, social centers, I mean for the people who cannot uh, visit to the city anymore, anymore, and it had also a kind of fantastic success because uh, I mean the people was reacted very interestingly to that uh, kind of to see Liepai uh, as a city where they would grow, uh, but they couldn't visit it for example uh, for ten years already. So and uh, yeah, it is, was like a beautiful opportunity. To, uh, yeah, how it was used as a yeah as a tool. There I is. Think, oh yeah, sure. Yeah, I can maybe add a little bit. So. Uh, not even uh, in a COVID time, I've seen a couple of attempts uh, in 2000, late 2016, 2017, when the uh, 360 cameras uh, became 
uh, more available 360 video cameras, I mean. And uh, there have been several attempts by uh, showing the concert on 360 format, so putting the camera uh, in, in the middle of the orchestra. But uh, uh, regarding the VR, actually, I think that still the technologies are uh, very much behind that kind of experience because uh, wearing the helmet uh, during the concert, it's tiring. So you can wear the helmet maybe for 10 minutes and that's very long already. So your eyes get tired, the helmet is heavy, your head, your neck get, gets tired. So uh, this is the question of uh, really of the technology. So. Uh, actually, continuing on this VR thing, we have, uh, maybe you had uh, some comments for those yeah, who yeah, are Yeah, online. sorry, just yeah, to, sure. to Alan. add something. I, I think uh, VR and in general, actually, digital is, should be complementary uh, to what we, we uh, to live and what we know uh, to now. Uh, but for example, we have a project, it is not uh, yet done, but uh, uh, typically for classical music, if we can, uh, using 360 cameras, and using those technologies like light, like light, light field, where you do not rely on the position of the camera, but using a, a series of camera, then you can reconstruct the whole volume uh, of the of the, the concert place, and propose to the the, the 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 visitors to really move inside and get close to the artist, and even with the sound to listen to the particular instrument. Uh, especially removing the odors, all that kind of things could be experience that we propose in the future, maybe within five years, uh, as an alternative. Maybe it's not long, effectively, as you mentioned, maybe it's for education, but I think it's really a complement that can be interesting. Yes, I was about to read this question from Slido that said, would you suggest combining a physical event with VR experience, for example, in theater, opera, or live concert? And what are the risks there, if any? I, I, I heard that Raita said it can be hard for your head, you know, uh, starting aching for, for a long concert, but maybe what are your, ex maybe there is a good example that you know. I know some exhibitions that have been combined, it's really interesting. Uh, in Ars Electronica, I've experienced some really nice art through the VR, but using it maybe for yeah, I think it was like 10 minutes. Um, but what are your experience? Maybe Clemens or Daniel has some experience with that. Maybe I may answer to that. So I feel like the, the way we talk about this is often that we have this assumption, oh, if I put on this headset and I use this technology, it will be more immersive, it will be more empathetic. And so we have this assumption that this technology is some sort of empathy machine that has this inherent value to our experience. And I think we need to take a step back there and we, we, we always ask for lighter headsets, better resolution. And I, I think we should take a step back and ask, is this really what a concert is about? Are we somehow looking for technological replacements for something that isn't technological? And so with VR, I think one of the very important things to always mention is it's not a social experience. And for me, a social experience, a concert is a social experience. But with the headset, you're on your own. You're doing your own thing. You can't see the others. And so I just want to take us to take, take a step back from this assumption that somehow the technology will make it more intense or, or better by giving us all these pixels and all this high resolution. I just don't think that this is the way we need to approach this, but rather think about conceptually, why is it really conceptually necessary to work with VR in a certain moment? What is the added value there? And engage with the medium and not just try to transport existing things in there mindlessly. we shouldn't be looking for replacement, but rather extension. And, and therefore, in performing arts, I'm personally also most interested in combination of both, live experience and then different kind of reality uh, where, where it's necessary or conceptual, conceptually important. Let's say there are some amazing work done where artificial, artificial intelligence steps in and starts guiding the course of performance or remote control where we can all of a sudden connect with audience in completely other part of the world, which is again important conceptually for the show. So I think these are uh, probably at the moment uh, realms where we can explore a lot. Thank you. I remember right, this in your presentation, you, you started to tell something about data and you said you want to mention that in discussion afterwards. And Gundiga just mentioned this artificial intelligence guiding, uh, guiding the viewer. Uh, what was that you wanted to mention about this data thing? I wanted to ask you. I noticed that in your presentation. Uh, yeah, data, 
data, digital data in general, so that's the big discussion about uh, who owns it, uh, who can use it, who gets access to it, and that leads to this question of uh, uh, accessibility, actually. Uh, so uh, at the moment, what we experience, uh, we actually don't pay attention to our, in our everyday lives very much to the... Uh, uh, what the tra what traces we are leaving behind uh, ourselves by using cell phones or, or uh, browsing internet so but uh, this is the big question and that always has to be stressed so and uh, that always has to be asked so who uh, gets access to the data who owns it and how it has been used and there is a again so there has to be a discussion about particularly about uh, large data sets and use of artificial intelligence uh, to uh, uh, classify, to actually to, to organize those data and to get meaning out of data because data themselves doesn't mean anything. So if it's a huge amount of data so uh, and we look at it, so we, we can't kind of get meaning out of it. So there is a need to uh, organize it, analyze it, and interpret it. And so that's the big question. So I, I'm just kind of touching those points. I don't have any kind of uh, really message about like how they should be kind of, uh, but, but we have to keep up uh, this discussion and also in culture and arts. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. There is a question for Alan uh, on Slido. You said that universities are using the Montreux Jazz Festival digital archive. Who benefits from it the most? Are those uh, students of music or someone else? Well, it's all the students, actually. We, we work with more than 300 researchers, and not only in musicology, as I, as I in my example, design, architecture, neuroscience, signal processing. So there are many, uh, and not only in technology, uh, in social and human science, in art, so we, we are at that, at that step where we now enlarge actually the, the accessibility to many, many different fields. So we'll see, but it's actually really promising. Uh, yeah, so yes. Yeah, thank you. Gundik, you wanted to say something? Oh. Okay, and uh, there's uh, another question. What would you have to say regarding how digital tools can make culture more available to anyone? Is it possible or is culture becoming more elitist? Who wants to answer that question? Yes. I, the... I, I think it's a very, very good and important question because uh, I think we have this presumption or uh, belief that with digitalization we solve problem of accessibility, which is far not the case. And we always have to keep in mind that the very basic access to internet is very different in different parts of the world and not talking about knowledge or tools and knowledge yeah, how to use them. So actually digitalization can exclude people as much as include new groups of users. I, I completely agree with Gundega and uh, uh, now during pandemic time we saw that like a lot of uh, especially music industry went digitally and uh, like uh, it was like a you know solution for everything yes now we are on Facebook so we are accessible and um, it was a bit wrong and uh, now we are uh, we also did it as a concert hall and we are considered now in Latvia as the first concert hall that kind of trying to digitalize, digitalize um, all the performances which is a bit late for I mean uh, even our in Baltic states but uh, we are still in Latvia doing that the first but when we are making now a digital platform um, we are thinking about this accessibility question quite a lot so um, especially that we have to uh, work with digital audience and we have to provide them the professional tools how to watch professional arts and music so it's uh, not throw something on YouTube or so throw something on Facebook but still it's kind of really built a digital community and um, um, yeah it's not really uh, an easy solution just to be uh, to go on social media and everything is solved now so we are not our digital maturity is not the same as for Montreux festival so I mean your examples are fantastic and you're working from 2007 but from the beginners we're really thinking about that yeah and if I can add something uh, digital uh, does not have a, a, a life duration which is as uh, as certain as analog. Uh, yeah, in Montreux, we had tapes, analog tapes, uh, 
uh, we could read them easily after 50 years. You can let them 50 years uh, with your hard drives or your CDR, no way. And actually we'll have to really take care of digital data much more than we, we, we used to do for analog. This is another challenge. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Clemens or Daniel, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I wanted to say that um, uh, in terms of this accessibility, it's also interesting uh, because we produce this kind of, let's say, um, door towards our exhibition through uh, this way of um, uh, getting this cardboard and then setting up everything with your smartphone. So on the one hand, uh, we have this problem that uh, maybe people without the cardboard are not able to access, uh, without a smartphone, are not able to access uh, the exhibition, but on the other hand, look at what uh, VR exhibition would mainly be. It would be uh, that we would bring a VR headset to the exhibition space and people can watch it there. So the uh, if you look at the institution, they need to buy these kind of technology uh, instead of using existing te technology. So there is a kind of, uh, let's say, different levels of or different hierarchies of accessibility. Um, but what I think if institutions are uh, like presenting these technologies, like the newest Oculus with the best uh, hard drive or the best graphic card and whatever, it's normalizing also these kind of technologies to the whole society. Uh, and thereby other people are getting lost and lost and getting like uh, behind more and more. So I think uh, it needs also this kind of balance that you have maybe processes that helps people uh, to, to, to access these kind of artworks or to access these kind of exhibitions. But on the other hand, um, uh, to, to really critically think about uh, new technologies and how to use them, what also Gundaga and um, um, Clemens were saying here. And I think this balance is really something that also, or the, the discussion around this balance is something that came up uh, at that, uh, in that time, in that current time, that we really have to go more into detail. Uh, what do we want to present, where and how? Uh, Wright wants to comment. Yeah, maybe just uh, not from the artist perspective and uh, uh, also from the teacher, art teacher perspective, as I'm teaching uh, in several art schools. Uh, talking about accessibility from that point, it is uh, a big question uh, to what kind of tools, digital tools, uh, artists can get access to. So as, uh, and, and this is a question of financing uh, mainly, because uh, those artworks which we are looking uh, at, uh, which are represented around the world and, and uh, are a very sophisticated, very, uh, high quality so behind those artworks there's a huge uh, huge huge institution huge budget and and huge production and uh, if you uh, don't put this uh, in education actually then uh, those young artists will lag behind so because uh, with the exploring, with the exploring with accessibility to the tools, so they just can uh, bring it further and learn uh, actually new skills and also uh, put the meaning in in uh, those new forms of the art. So without that, so there's just a kind of big generalization, and we can talk just about uh, general uh, digital content, which is uh, YouTube, uh, Instagram, and and all those platforms mm -hmm. and uh, we in the first block we actually talked a lot about this digital maturity and about the skills right uh, you're you're following everything digital in art uh, in Latvia and abroad also creating your own exhibitions and being a professor at universities how would you rate Latvian digital maturity and uh, how is Latvian government uh, and uh, also public sector doing while, while helping it it's not about education, but more, maybe more about how digital, uh, digital and ready for the digital transformation and culture are we in Latvia? I think it's, it's uh, yeah, we, we are kind of a uh, small group, small uh, scale model, I think, of the world in, in general. So there are many uh, different layers also here in Latvia. So the uh, possibility to... Uh, create very high level products uh, in arts and in also commercially and and there's also a very uh, uh, like big gap between uh, 
digital skills and digital know-how uh, between uh, people here and between uh, also in art world the same so and again so this is very much about uh, accessibility to the tools so this is a one question so of course then there's a question of, of uh, people who are teaching uh, uh, and, and sh presenting and showing those tools to, to uh, students and, and uh, pupils so uh, we have another question from Slido.com addressed to, uh, I guess, Clements and uh, Daniel, asking, how old was the average audience of In We Are We Trust? Do you know the, the average audience, the age? No, we don't know this because we were not asking for these kind of informations. Okay. Um, there's another well, question. We can maybe say to this, so, so just to add something from the personal feedback that we got from certain viewers, is that we did notice that above an age of, say, 50, 55, 60, the amount of technological problems that people had with accessing our exhibition exponentially increased. So we, we got uh, feedback from all kinds of audience, but the older people got, of course, the more technological problems they had. This is something we can say, with, even if we don't know what the share of these older people was. Though. Thank you. Uh, there's another question. Uh, anyone can answer this. How digital possibilities have opened culture to an audience that hasn't been reached before? Maybe you have some good experience. Yes, Timur. Oh, yes, as we are kind of newcomers in this digital world and we are um, uh, situated in Liepai. And Liepai is on the west of Latvia. It's, uh, we are, have a beautiful, fantastic house, but it's considered a regional concert hall. Um, and then, of course, uh, when uh, we decided to go out, we saw who is uh, our audience. Before, as a regional concert hall, our approximately 70% of our audience was uh, inside around Liepai, in Liepai and around it. But uh, when we went digitally, it uh, became 10% uh, of Liepaja and 90% of whole Latvia and uh, diaspora, Latvian diaspora in the whole of the world. So we, uh, when we made concerts uh, for um, uh, for tickets, uh, for, for money, we counted approximately 25 countries who participate in this. And of course, it's a, a fantastic opportunity to reach the audience who had never probably come to Latvia and it was from USA to Uzbekistan uh, when we got some you know uh, ticket sales and it was uh kind of a fantastic opportunity for the regional concert hall who probably <laughs> would never um, expect such an old international audience before but what are your um, uh, maybe um, outcome of you told about this diaspora I mean the diaspora in Latvia was reached by this digital uh, uh, master classes, where was it? Yeah, we first, of course, we did a lot of uh, children uh, and uh, concerts for schools, and actually, it was specially designed, digitally designed um, programs with the Leipzig Symphony Orchestra, and it was covered by huge, really huge audience in Latvia, in the whole, whole regions of it uh, used our program and um, uh, but it's also interesting that the concert was followed by Latvian diaspora who living abroad and it was a big surprise for us uh, that uh, they were reconnected with the city or with the country by our cultural programs and also not uh, just the newcomers but for example we had feedbacks from people who emigrated in the 70s for example and was happy to reconnect with Liepaja uh, which probably before uh, was never possible to do and of course it's it, it, these are the those inspiring stories uh, which can, um, yeah, that uh, inspires us to work um, in this field too. But of course we are, are not uh, going only digital, I mean I believe in this digital or physical digital concept that it only can survive in that way. Yeah, thank you. Gundega? Uh, I think it's also, it would be interesting to actually do a research on uh, how uh, it in a way professionalizes the field because maybe now when there are all those remote possibilities to connect. It's more about people who are professionally interested or interested in certain ideas rather than people who live together in the same area or region. So maybe we are moving from physical space that we share so we kind of uh, come together because we live together to uh, more gathering around ideas. And there the kind of... Um, the problem might be that actually we become even more and more uh, in our own bubble. So we have people, yes, from Uzbekistan, Tajikistan but, uh, and UK, but maybe they are all professionals who, who are professionally connected with music. 
It might be, of course, and we are also, it's also a part of our audience. And uh, of course, uh, we cannot deny that. Uh, uh, m but we hope that somehow it's also kind of connect those people who probably could never access. And actually, I think, I'm thinking that uh, um, uh, we talk about this professional now, but I think, and we don't have the data for the moment, but for the young audience, uh, we have this image uh, in Latvia special that we have quite a lot of young audience in the halls because of the beautiful music education system. But, uh, um, uh, I mean, ask the teenagers if they want to, or, or I don't know, 20, 25 years old, if they want to spend uh, their evening, uh, Friday or Saturday evening, sitting in the chairs uh, just without moving uh, with the people they don't know, and maybe they are, you know, um, average age is way, um, um, you know, higher than uh, their company, but. Uh, uh, sometimes they just come together in a home party drinking wine and maybe putting some music on the background, uh, classical music on the background, and I believe that it's happening already now, but we just cannot have maybe statistical access to that, but it will bring new audience, uh, young audience, who just, um, yeah, not used maybe to go to this uh, a bit uh, old-fashioned spaces, uh, which is the physical concert halls. Uh, I was thinking also about the people who have, uh, you know, uh, maybe problems with moving or people with special needs or diseases that they have to be at home. Uh, and I think maybe this time with COVID and also uh, the digital transformation that it opened this this kind of new audience. Do you have exam uh, examples with that maybe? Yes, of course. And this is a huge example of it. And especially uh, me as a young director who is thinking who will be his audience in 20 years because I will work in the in the, in the the field also in 20 years, believe me. So, and uh, um, I know I see just my parents uh, who are around 60 years old, 55, 60s, but they are constantly using Facebook and social media and so and so, but there will be a moment in a, f in a maybe healthy way or they cannot move or I don't know, or they cannot attend any more concerts, but those, they are quite digitally advanced already now, and we are pretty sure that in five, 10 years, or maybe later, there will be, there, they will be our perfect audience uh, for, uh, you know, a big part of the audience uh, who will listen to our concerts. And I think that in five and ten years we will not discuss about it anymore. It will be just a reality. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, maybe there is uh, some comment from those who are online. Alan or uh, Clemens or Daniel. Yeah. There's two things that, that are coming to my mind now. The one thing is that when I look back at our exhibition and how we were late to the physical spaces that we were supposed to exhibit in, I realized that for sites, uh, which is more of a definitely more of an off location in Germany, we would have reached an audience there that we did not reach now because we focus so much on the online space. And so I, I realized that by us focusing more on the national and international scale, we lost this focus for engaging with the local community, a community that we would have maybe otherwise more engaged with just because we moved our capacity from a local outreach to a network outreach. And so this is the one risk that I see where they would just like lose these regional connections and people that are not so agile online. And the other thing I wonder about is that if we don't create too much, I would maybe say competition um, by everybody being online. Because if I put myself up a viewer and I know there's all these concerts, all these exhibitions online, I feel like there will be these economies of scale where just everything is sucked up by these few big players that have massive budgets to do very good projects. But this diversity that we had before, where you had a local connection to something and thereby establishing a very diverse scene, uh, might be risked by just a few mega players, as we see, for example, with newspaper these days, uh, where this is dominated by a few big players with a lot of budget. And we lose, at least what I, I can say from Germany, I don't know the situation in other countries, we maybe lose this diaspora of so many small, locally connected cultural institutions, which I would find very sad because I think that's very important for a diverse cultural scene. On this, uh, uh, we have to finish. The time is out. And uh, thank you for joining this discussion. I mean, it's really challenging to have six people uh, for half an hour, a really interesting topic. But thank you. I felt that it's a really fruitful discussion. We discussed a lot of things and there'll be uh, maybe some some ups or outcomes after this. Thank you, Timur Sreit, Isen Gondig, and thank you for those who are online, uh, Clemens and Daniel and Alan. Thank you for joining us and having your time with us in the conference. Hope to see you soon, live sometime soon in some art exhibition, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you for that. And uh, so we have finished the second block of our conference. 
And I would uh, like to ask you to use Slido again. And uh, Slido, uh, you need to use a hashtag, DigiCulture. And we would like to ask you a question. How would you evaluate your organization level of digital skills? So, not your, uh, both yours and or your organization levels. It's basic, understanding, novice, intermediate, advanced, or expert. So let's see, what are the, ex, uh, what are the answers? So it's right now it's basic understanding and intermediate, half half. <laughs> right. I was wondering what would be my answer. I think I'd be. I think I'd be intermediate. I think. I try to follow things, but I, the older I get, I feel that it's so hard to follow. Like, for example, I'm not on TikTok, or I am. I am, but I don't use it. Uh, but, um, yes, so we see the majority is basic understanding. Oh, novice, it's interesting. Right. Okay, thank you for your answers. It's, it's nice to feel you, uh, because it's all digital. It's nice to feel you that you are here in the conference. Um, and I'm not speaking just to the camera. And... Uh, we have come to the third block, and the third block is about digital transformation of cultural management. This block is quite a um, practical block where we can speak about management uh, and how we can turn management into the, you know, this cult transformation of digital. And our first speaker is the director of digital of Tate, Hilary Knight. She is a senior executive for over 20 years of experience delivering, delivering growth of creative and cultural organizations. She combines a wealth of experience in strategy and leadership with deep experience in digital and new technologies, audience-centric approaches. Hello, Hilary, are you there and ready to be the first speaker of the block named Digital Transformation of Cultural Management? Hello, yes, I am. Hello. Hey. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so, hello, everybody. It's, it's very nice to be here today. Um, I'm going to talk for a few minutes about museums and digital strategy. I'm conscious that this is a music festival, but I think there's lots and lots that we all have in common. Um, so I will just dig in. Now, um, nobody is going to be surprised if I tell you that we live in a time of great disruption. The reality is though we lived in this disruptive time before the pandemic, we have just been much more disrupted over the last uh, 18 months, the last year and a half. Um, and we live in a very interconnected world. Our audiences have digital lives. If you consider the digital life that you have as an individual, your audiences have that as well. Um, business is conducted digitally, and therefore digital transformation is imperative for our institution's survival and relevance. Um, and what I'm talking about here is, is that digital strategy for the whole organization. Um, one of the things I would guard against and caution against is having a digital strategy that's just for the digital bit, the audience facing digital output of your organization. This is a strategy that the, the whole organization needs to be on board with and aware of and buy into because it's about doing business, new ways of doing business in the 21st century. And, and this is why it's so important to an organizational organization survival. And um, when I talk about digital here, I'm not just talking about the technology. Um, now, that obviously is very important, but digital are also the, the tools and the processes and the people who put information, objects and stories together and to tell those stories for a new public or communicate or present art to the public. And museums and galleries are tremendous repositories of artifacts and knowledge. I'm gonna go out on a limb and assume that a concert hall is also a great repository of at least knowledge and possibly archives of performance and therefore assets. They also, we also as organizations hold deep knowledge. We encourage inquiry and communication and connection. These are things we don't often put on show on the walls, but they are things that we should be using and le leveraging in our digital uh, expression as well. And this is what I mean when I say it's a, it's a strategy for the whole organization. It's not just the holders of the digital tools. Um, and all of this, when you consider it, when I consider it, um, makes me think that we, we need to reassess how we deliver our purpose as organizations. 
Um, we should be looking to be more than just venues, just destinations for people to come to. Um, my argument would be that we are, we are providers of experience and content to audiences, our local audiences, our in-person audiences, but also the, the rest of the world, the audiences out there and across our nations and globally. So I'm going to take you step by step just for a few minutes through what is quite a basic outline for digital strategy and, and how I start to approach it. Um, so the components of a strategy, uh, the purpose is absolutely key. Of course, how does this link to the organization's mission? Ideally, your digital strategy should be how do you deliver your organization's mission digitally? So at Tate, our mission is to help, the, uh, help people connect and feel inspired by and enjoy art. So how do we do that digitally? This isn't a different thing, it's just new ways of delivering our mission. The target audience is absolutely key and I will speak to this a little bit later on and I, I heard, I caught the, the tail end of the previous session and I, I heard speakers talking about um, audiences as well. It's, we need to understand our audiences in ways that we haven't before. It's really important and it can be challenging to under, understand and agree who a target audience is, but it is really vital. Audiences are part of, um, a part of the process of how we deliver um, a digital experience. And digital audiences don't equal your in-gallery audiences. Don't assume that what happens in gallery, what works for your audiences who come to the gallery will work for your audiences online. And another final point on audiences at the, for now is um, in thinking about your target audiences, you should also be thinking about how you're going to measure your success. What, what does success look like? Um, and who are you trying to reach and how and what will they be doing and use that to set some objectives because um, the world of digital is vast and you could be trying to do everything at once but actually focus on a target audience focus on what you're delivering to them will get you a long way assets I speak to a lot of people who, who tell me that, that they they don't have a lot of digital capacity but generally most of our organizations have a lot of assets we have our collection um, we have our archive we have the knowledge that I've talked about. We also have people. People are assets as well. Don't forget them. Infrastructure, when I'm talking about this, I mean the tools and the systems, of course. This can mean the technological infrastructure, and it's really important that that is maintained. Um, again, part of doing business in the 21st century is to maintain and hold and manage your digital infrastructure. But it's also about the processes. Digital requires different processes. Um, we work with agile processes uh, in the digital division at Tate. Um, that doesn't always align with the processes of putting on an exhibition, um, which is rather more waterfall and, um, and very established. So knowing and understanding your infrastructure, both your tools and your systems, but also your processes, um, gives you an opportunity to try and find places where you can align and where you can weave digital processes, things like um, review, audience testing, user experience, how you can weave those through um, your organization's business. Digital literacy, again, I heard this mentioned in the previous session. This is really important. We're in the 21st century. It's really important that as professionals, in whatever capacity, we have some understanding of digital life because it is what our audiences are doing. It's part of how we deliver our business. Um, and so it is on our shoulders as professionals in whatever capacities to educate ourselves and to try and keep up to date. You don't have to understand how to do something. Um, you don't have to be able to do it, but you do need to understand why it's important and why it matters and what it's doing to culture. And then digital skills is of course the all important ability to deliver. And you do need some people in your organization to do this. So they need to have the ability, but they also need to have permission. They've got to be able to go ahead and do. Um, so. Moving on. So audiences, I promised a little bit more. So I'm going to speak to this very quickly because I'm watching my clock tick down. Um, in 2019 to 20, these were the visits to Tate. Don't worry about trying to read all the slices of the pie. Look at the pink one. The pink one are the digital audiences for Tate. Now, a reminder, this is before the pandemic. So for many years now, our digital audiences have exceeded our in-gallery audiences. Of course, there's some overlap between the two. Some of our in-gallery audiences are our online audiences as well. Some of them come on online to just to book tickets, but there is a significant number who are not coming. And therefore we know we also have an audience online who are unique to the digital space. We need to remember that. Um, this is 2021, so the pink is almost everything. 
Our galleries were closed for the majority of the year. Reopening is under social distancing measures, which meant that people had to book, which drove some of our in-gallery audiences who don't visit us online, online. Now, obviously the pandemic is a dreadful, horrible experience, but there is a small, small benefit in now being able to understand those audiences who previously weren't coming online because now they have to. Um, and then a very quick nod to the more global nature of our audiences online. This is just a recognition that they're not all UK. In fact, only about half of them are UK, less than half. Um, and we need to bear that in mind when we're creating content. They also um, aren't necessarily looking for tape when they arrive with us, they're looking for art. Um, and so this is how I hold very simple mental model of audiences in my head. The in-person proportion of the general available audience is very small. The museum website feels like a much bigger audience, but actually it's bigger than the in-person audience, but not the biggest it can be. We have our social platforms, which reach millions and millions of people, bigger still. But we need to hold in our minds that there is a potential available audience for our cultural institutions that far exceeds the numbers who will ever be able to visit us in person. And we need to bear them in mind when we are considering a digital strategy. This is an opportunity for us all as cultural institutions to develop culture for our local spaces, for our, our regional spaces, for our national spaces, and for a global platform to create participatory, experiential, digital spaces. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly here about um, what gets in the way because we have to be honest. Um, and this is relatively new for um, us as museums, as cultural places. We managed to uh, avoid a lot of the digital disruption that was wrought on things like print journalism and publishing and music industry and the TV industry and the film industry back in the 90s and early noughties. We managed to avoid all of that. So this is our huge disruption and it is the measure of, of organizations about how they step forward to it. But some things that get in the way. Perfectionism versus minimum viable product. Minimum viable product is a digital construct and concept that says, let's get something live that is good enough for our audiences to use now. And then we will iterate, we will improve it, but they can use it now. Um, in a gallery, of course, we don't do that with exhibitions. Our exhibition has to be absolutely perfect before we open the doors. I'm not proposing we change that, although I think there's some interesting experiments we could play with, um, but, we have to understand that there is a different process. There is a difference. And if we hold our digital um, experiences to that same level of perfectionism, they will not be good enough when we launch because they will not have been forged in that public space. And that speaks to misaligned processes, the agile versus waterfall processes. Not having a data strategy is really important. So a data strategy is about how you hold your institution's data. So for us, it's our data about our collection. What is the data we hold on our collection? How is it structured? Is it well managed? Is it in good shape? It's also about what is our data strategy around the information we're gleaning from our audiences when they visit us? How, of course, we must hold it safe and adhere to all of the legal um, frameworks around that. But also, what is our strategy? How are we going to use the data our audiences give us to make the experience better for them, to improve their encounter with Tate? or with any organization. A creaking in infrastructure and not factoring digital as core are linked. This is, I'm gonna say it again, part of being a business in the 21st century. We need to maintain and manage and fund our infrastructures. Our digital and technological infrastructures are a vital part of our organizations, just as vital as our buildings. And if we don't consider digital to be part of our core business, it risks being left behind, being underfunded and incurring technical debt. Organizations that had enormous amounts of technical debt at the start of the pandemic struggled more than organizations that didn't. And then in summary, in my final couple of minutes, it is absolutely imperent, imperative and very urgent that we develop digital capabilities across the cultural sector. One point I missed off here, to enrich the sector, to make us better, to help us serve new audiences to help us better serve our existing visitors, to help us understand them and reach them with things that they will be delighted with. Um, to increase our reach and impact, we're moving from um, places located in physical space 
to places that are encountered online internationally. To build our organizational resilience, we need to be able to be adaptable and flexible and able to move forward into the unknown. We do not know what the future holds, but having the tools and the digital that digital affords us and the skills and the processes and our capacities will help us build more modern, flexible uh, teams, structures, processes in our organizations that will make us fit for purpose and more resilient um, both now and in the future. Um, I've got plenty more to say, of course, but um, I will hand back and hopefully pick it up in the discussion. Thank you for your presentation. Um, so we have a next speaker online, and uh, it is Bettina Yagi, and she's a representative from the Lutzen Festival, and she's a head of the marketing, of course. After working at the Beale Solothurn Theatre, the Renga Music Festival and the Ruhr Piano Festival, she joined the Lutzen Festival in 2016 and she will tell us more about digitalization uh, at the Lutzen Festival with outlook on some projects. Hello Bettina, are you there? We cannot hear you? No, a classical thing. Before yes. Hello Thank you. there. <laughs> so, um, Nice to meet you all on this um, digital wave and I uh, give you a short overview about what we are doing when it comes to digitalization. And a uh, classical thing, we've got a problem with the presentation. So, um, a nice guy from your side will help me with the new slide. So, could you please show us the next slide? Yes, um, just a few words about us, about Lucerne Festival, who we are, what we are standing for. Well, we've got a big aim. Uh, we try to be, to say about ourselves, we are festival. And the things we are wanting to do is we want to have the future of music inside. And it, if it comes to digitalization, um, fu the future uh, impact should be there too. So these are two things there perfectly joining together, music and future and digitalization. So please, the next slide. Um, we have um, just a very short overview about our three worlds, about our three pillars. Um, the worlds uh, are standing on our main goals. Uh, we've got symphony, um, our big symphony concerts, uh, the world leading orchestra, among them our own orchestra, the Lucerne Festival Orchestra, founded by Claudia Bader and our director Michael Herfliger. The contemporary um, pillar, um, it's um, it's a fair of the heart for us. The contemporary music and um, an integral um, component of our programming, and with our academy and the new founded uh, Lucerne Festival Contemporary Orchestra. Um, we own a wonderful ensembles for this music. And last but not least, Music for Future, um, the possibility to uh, endorse a future generation of musicians uh, via workshops, via concerts, um, with a lot of debut concerts. And these are the three pillars who, who are founding us and our festival. Next, please. And um, with this three pillars, um, we've uh, kind of a year round presence, um, organizing three festivals each year, one in spring with a focus on the Lucerne Festival Orchestra, one in August, a new festival named Forward um, with a focus on contemporary music uh, played by musicians uh, who are coming out of our own academy and who are founding the uh, so-called Lucerne Festival Contemporary Orchestra. And in the summer, it's our big steamer, um, the summer festival, this a special topic, a special theme for each year. Um, this summer it will be crazy. Who could think of that in a year of Corona? Um, this is uh, has a duration of over four, five, four weeks um, with more than 100 concerts. Many of them uh, in the wonderful KKL uh, in the sun based uh, at the lakefront and a few on the mountains. And with this uh, concert and the festivals, we're reaching about 70,000 uh, visitors, visitors each year. And um, one thing that is very important for us, and uh, a thing, even if you're, um, it's important we are uh, discussing 
um, digitalization is that we are mainly main, mainly um, self-financed with 95%. The next, please. Yes, just a just very short overview about um, our classical um, digital activities. We are working with five very classical uh, social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, uh, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Um, having up to 10 uh, streams of concerts uh, per year, live or um, ones that are broadcast later on. Um, and we are trying to focus on our own concerts, but are also uh, streaming concerts of the, the guest orchestras. Yes, and you are seeing the figures about um, 300,000 website visits, 2.0 million website visitors. That's just a very short overview about where we are standing now uh, with our, especially with our social media channels. Um, the next, you can skip, I think. Yes, and going directly to the next one. So the main thing we are wanting, we are discussing today, why we should work and foster our uh, digital engagement. Um, what could be the, the goals, what could be uh, the benefits of digitalization, especially if it comes to, to marketing and um, communication with our customers. As all of us know, um, with digital tools, it's possible to approach a customer with much more individualization. For example, if she or he wants to visit a great romantic concert, the possibility that he will uh, buy a ticket uh, for baroque repertoire or singer is nearly zero. And so why should I suggest uh, to him uh, a concert uh, from a epoch he doesn't like? And so it should be our aim to individualize our communication and to, if we are contacting the customer, he should get the things he wants to get, uh, to the suggestions he wants to get, the concerts he wants to get. And, and especially for a, for a festival like us, um, I think digitalization opens us the possibility to get in contact with the customer, not only during um, the festivals, uh, we've got a presence of around about 40 days a year, but to have the possibility to have a year round presence, to be present 365 days with the customer, to be in, in his mind and not to be forgotten. And sure, um, a digital uh, presence makes it much more easier to, to measure everything we are doing. Uh, every one of you knows our budgets are just limited and we have to, to think about what we are doing with our money and what we can gain with this uh, things we are doing. And I think uh, that's a great thing about digitalization that we can now measure what we are doing and if we are good at it. The next, please. Um, so what we are doing at the moment to, to reach an audience of 365 days a year. Um, one thing is we created a new format on our website, uh, especially during the Corona year. Um, this is titled Connected. It's, um, it contains uh, regular discussions, uh, meetings with our director, with, with artists. It's the format Michael and Friends. Um, short concert, especially um, filmed in Lucerne, talks, explanatory formats. So a whole bunch of, of um, different formats that give the audience uh, insight to the festival, what we are doing, what we are planning, and who we are. Um, we are staying um, in the memories. Um, we are trying to be authentic, authentic as everyone does uh, on these channels. And we are trying to give insights. Then streaming is one big thing we are at at the moment. Uh, I told you we are already streaming a couple of, co uh, of concerts, um, but we are now thinking about um, uh, possibilities to get it um, on a more regular basis, maybe even with a, with a own platform for the festival with an archive with additional information about the concert, about the artists. Um, and again, the, the main goal to have an all year round presence, plus to develop, um, develop maybe a streaming customer to a, a concert goer. 
Um, and then we have the thing we are doing at the moment is uh, additional digital campaigns. Um, last year, we had a campaign called Solidarity for Music. We, uh, um, we collected notes, tones from musicians who could not um, uh, perform during the lockdown. And um, users had to, to send in short films with uh, Beethoven's uh, Oder an die Freude. Out to joy, and the, the goals were engagement of the customers, an opening to a larger, a younger target group, uh, with a great affinity to social media, and um, this was a thing that was, I think, quite quite good. <laughs> we had uh, 375 videos that had been sent and uploaded by more than 1,710 um, participants. It had been individuals. It had choirs. It had. Um, um, popular musicians from Switzerland who, who um, send it in their videos. And at the end, we were happy uh, about a social media reach of 7 million and uh, 285,000 Swiss uh, francs uh, of money they could, could give and donate to, to the musicians. Um, something totally new for us uh, with a lot of work about but uh, i think uh, we could can be quite happy about the things that uh, they are that they are at the moment and at the end um and other idea i think maybe of us of you are already um doing is a close collaboration uh, with the artists especially with takeovers or talks uh, to get to get an authentic view on a festival and on the artists um, plus, as every of us is trying to uh, want to give a look behind the scenes of the festival via different formats. Um, the next, please. Um, so it's not about only about the digital edge uh, channels. It's all, also about uh, the customer journey along uh, special. Um, digital touch points. Um, it's a lot of things you're seeing on this slide. I just want to want to to, uh, to name some of them. Uh, it's again uh, um, a very individual individual um, con uh, conversation with them, I'm mainly based on a good CRM. Um, we are trying to to uh, improve our fast, uh, festival website and to make it much more individual. That's not that easy as uh, we thought it would be. Um, we are trying to get to get in touch with the audience, especially our, at the venue, with additional information um, and uh, to to get in touch surely after the concerts with them and to to keep us again with the with the goal to be in the mind uh, and that they maybe buy tickets for next year. The next, please. Um, as as uh, said at the beginning, uh, I wanted to talk also not only about our status quo, but also about uh, some uh, project we are already um, working with. I'm sorry, it's in the headlights. Kai, it's AE artificial intelligence. I'm talking about, and at the moment we are um, working with a company um, that helps us if it comes to social media campaigns especially to, to uh, sell individual concerts better. And uh, they are working with uh, AE-based um, uh, thing that uh, builds taste clusters. Um, you compare this with the recommendations uh, or algorithms uh, Netflix is working on. And, and each taste cluster can be based on up to 200, 200 features. Um, and the basis for these uh, are sources like Wikipedia, like Spotify, like Worklist, etc. Plus uh, the known and the knowledge of musicians. Um, and the data source for all these things is uh, about uh, has more than uh, 22 million artists, not all classical, and six, 60 million titles. So these spaces makes it possible to describe each concert on a basis uh, of more than 1,000 features. And these features make it possible for us to um, get in touch directly with the customer we want to uh, contact. And um, 
that's a thing that works us very, 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 very good at the moment. We are working for the, for the second year now, and uh, we were able to, to increase uh, ticket sales for, for certain concerts. Um, the next, please. Um, another thing we are just trying out, we are, it's not that long we are working with that uh, feature, is a, a content export um, and quite new feature. Um, and it's still a kind of a testing phase. Um, it's a kind of a questionnaire tool uh, which asks the visitor which artists or which musical epoch or which kind of venues, a big one, a smaller one, he or she likes best. Um, and we're now working for it for two months, but the first insights we, we've got is um, that people are spending much more time on our website and calling up much more pages uh, on the website as an average user. Uh, we can do not have any experience um, or database that is good enough uh, to, to, to have anything about uh, if the sales are getting and rising up. And the last and next one, please. Um, it's a thing we are just thinking about. It's not realized yet, but um, as all of you know, uh, streamings cost a lot of money, uh, but streamings are quite helpful for, for you, for your brand, um, for your recommendation. And now we are thinking about the possibility, what, what would it mean if we would be able to um, let us help um, recording concerts by um, artificial intelligence based on based on uh, the on the, on the on score and uh, this is a thing if it could be quite uh, quite a good thing for the future but we are just thinking about it and kind of dreaming about it and so that's that's the end of the presentation the short presentation um just to give you a short insight and in the things we are talking about they're thinking about we're talking about and with it and i hope uh, a helpful insight thank you thank you bettina the representative from lutzern festival uh, now the next speaker is a head of marketing from tonhal orchestra zurich it's uh, michaela brown uh, after having uh, worked at international organizations she settled in Zurich, working many years for UBS in the brand management team. She was responsible for all sponsoring engagements worldwide in the field of classical music. And since 2011, she works for Tonhal Orchestra Zurich, where she is responsible for marketing and communications. And now she will share her thoughts and her story in marketing. Hello, Michael, uh, Michaela, are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, please. The floor sure. is yours. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, thanks so much for inviting me. Hello from Zurich. And um, I would like to go quickly through the uh, presentation of the orchestra and then um, analyze what sort of Corona did with us and with the digital communication or digital first, so to say. So I hope now, yes, that works. Um, the orchestra is um, one of the leading orchestras in the world. We are based in Zurich and we are quite an international crowd of musicians that are performing a lot of concerts um, each season. We have now been for four years in an interim venue and not performing at the Tonhalle because the hall was closed for major renovations. Um, helping us to get younger clients was above all in these four years a very good possibility because the um, the, uh, the, the the site we were building up was uh, in an industrialized area. It was a complete was rather a hip area of Zurich. Um, a lot of young people were going out there. Had a lot of parties when parties were still um, uh, possible. So that helped us to attract a bit of an other crowd of um, clients, some clients we were quite dreaming of for many years. And now we're moving back in September to the renovated hall and uh, we try now to get this crowd over to the Tonhalle, which is very central in Zurich. Um, we are doing the usual um, amount of concerts like any other um, great orchestra. 
Um, I would like just to point out that we have uh, quite some formats for younger people above all. Um, it was always very important for us to have something for all ages, of course, but also from people, for people from 20 to 40. We have groups of sort of students that work for many years with us. They are organizing concerts for peers and we have um, a project I call Tone Hare Late, which starts at 10 in the evening. The conductor explains a little bit the program and then you meet a DJ and then you dance the whole night, basically. Um, so uh, we have also invested a lot in, in, in film concerts, film music, because we think Film music is for many, many young people the only sometimes, or at least the first way, that how they get in contact with um, classical music. Um, sorry now. So, um, we have uh, with Pavo Yervi, since two years, a very charismatic uh, music director which is uh, which helped us above all in our digital world to move on or he forced us to move on because he's very active on all social media channels and because he has a quite big follower group we started to hand him over sometimes our channels so that he could uh, sort of do marketing and market for us um, when he's in Zurich not only when he rehearses with the orchestra but also when he what he does after uh, the concerts. Our audience is um, quite a loyal audience. They have been with us for, for many years. It's a very regional audience. Um, the ones of you that know Zurich, they know that um, Zurich offers plenty of things in the area of culture. There is a fantastic opera house. There is a, a great theater, um, many uh, jazz clubs. So there is a lot going on. My colleague Bettina from Lucerne Festival, she's not too far away so that you could even catch the train to go there for a concert. So the, the, the demand or rather the uh, challenge to be visible is extremely high. It's about the population of um, 1.5 million people that we can sort of reach. Um, now the digital interaction so what did corona to us um on on one hand i i don't dare to say it loud but it was a positive thing for all you did online um i was fighting for many years that um box office goers would finally buy their tickets online which they of course didn't and all of a sudden during corona we um sort of decided not to open box offices anymore. People could call and get their tickets, but they were not sort of allowed anymore to go to the box office. And that um, was kind of a, a turnover in the whole interaction, how they also would um, buy uh, their tickets. So what we did is uh, on one hand, we changed a bit our communication with our clients because we were not sort of we were not visible anymore we had no more concerts we could offer everything was closed and the way we were um, starting our communication even in a period of crisis which is normally in a period of crisis you don't have time to develop new things but the whole way we were communicating increased or changed actually dramatically we communicated different to the clients. We, we communicated still every two, three weeks, even though we had basically no news that we would come back on stage. Uh, we also did not do a lot of streamings. We decided not to do too many streamings because everybody was streaming, streaming and uh, we could not see the, um, the point of difference sort of we could um, create um, while doing um, streaming. So we were very honest also about our situation and about the situation of the musicians. We were rather creating sort of online agendas where musicians were giving ideas what they would either, how they would rehearse in a period like this, or what was their favorite menu, what, what, what were they reading, what were they actually doing. So we tried to get our audience close to the musician in, on a very personal um, setup or in, in a very personal way also. The, um, the whole 
digital transformation was there were two sides one was uh, in within the company how we uh, had to start to communicate because we hardly saw it because we were all in our home offices and um, the whole communication there got extremely transparent and with a lot of you of course as well very very flexible that taught us a lot on how we deal with each other and or how we patient might become which was before for sure not the case and i really hope that we can um, also continue with that it started really well to us for the clients we had uh, to face sort of uh, new habits um, they had um, they had sometimes different demands there were clients that were absolutely criticizing us that we did not do many more streams one thing is a question of money um, media were attacking us saying uh, you are sort of subsidized by the city you should do um, something for the people and if you decide not to do something like streaming you really have to keep cool and keep keep just going on the way you decided you move forward um, now in this period then i had um, start, started to um, to think how we use this chance sort of um we have now um so analyzing a bit how it will continue because we thought uh, the new challenging or the way we were communicating with the clients has changed completely or that that's also a chance so we called it sort of the new normal like many others do and um we thought that uh, we cannot assume to return to the past the way we communicated, but we must rather monitor the market and also the customer behavior. We have to react much more agile, much more flexible and um, meet also the customer expectations, which I think have um, really changed in one or the other way. Um, we were thinking about a new start we did a rebranding and we also thought that rebranding is also kind of a, a chance to position ourselves completely different than what we sort of did in the past and if you do such a repositioning of your brand then you always have to pay attention that you don't exclude maybe people that are not so um not not using um, digital data or digital um devices each day but we know also that 5.9 hours a day an adult is spending on the digital channel so that's a chance and we took that chance and we said okay if we move forward here we have to have clear focus on the most relevant measures that are important to us and say also to certain measures no because we we can't do everything and we have to have clear goals to assert ourselves um, in the market. Um, next, yeah. Then we were looking in um, sort of these points I listed out here in order to to define uh, our strategy. And uh, so we said, okay, we are a, a sort of a top orchestra. We inspire. We move people. There's something we want to continue. Uh, we want to address every age group we don't want to exclude anybody by just being basically digit on a digital journey ourselves and um, we had these um, overarching objectives we knew that touring which was a very important part of our business would be a completely different thing after corona so we said, okay, how can we go more local? How can we get uh, collaborations with other institutions? How can we work closer? And how do we benefit from this way um, of working together? And what is, of course, the benefit is to sort of um, arouse curiosity. So with that triggers, of course, then at the end, the uh, ticket purchase. And we hope really we can start in, in autumn again. We were open in between some weeks, but more than six months we were closed during uh, the winter months and part of the strategic outline was also how how are our concert programs do they still fit what has changed during this corona crisis or still changing and uh, what kind of programs people want to see 
uh, to hear and how can we sort of also deepen our music education. We have a lot of kids, uh, pupils coming, we have also stuff for adults. So how can we focus much more on the local area for, um, for our future clients, customers? As I said, the geographic market became very local and remains local. And um, the touring, if we go on tours, we decided to do basically residencies in order to be, to be also credible in, in that um, field. And it's we think if we do residencies, we can much more dig into another territory as if we come in, go out next day. Um, the customer segment, we really want to attract the younger generation. We need the uh, existing older generation. They are still very important for us. They are the big buyers of our season um, subscriptions. And, uh, but we have also realized in Corona times that the online behavior has completely changed and we want that the buyer becomes a future um, from a sponsor or a promoter of the orchestra. Um, we did in this process then, we defined a new um, setup of our online communication. That means in short words, we, our entry page is going to be the website. Everything important is communicated on the website. We go in depth on the website. And we saw over the last months, people were spending five, six times more time on our websites than in the past. We um, realized that we have to define our channels for the different age groups. We have decided after this Corona period that we don't print, for example, programs anymore. We have everything with QR codes. People are accepting this. They're very proud to find out that they know how to deal with um, QR codes. Uh, we are doing toys storytelling, small clips from one to three minutes for the um, rather younger generation. We have our intros into concerts um, via blogs where you can listen, uh, who is the conductor, who is the soloist, what they're going to play. We have set up a partnership with iDacha, which is a, a platform for audio streaming where you can listen to the, to the concerts. And also we had had before a, um, six um, magazines a year, we printed and we reduced that now to three magazines triggering stories in there and then leading via a QR code on our website. So our center of our world is basically the website that needs, of course, a lot of resources. That's something uh, we are working on, but it is key for us that the website is really the place sort of to be when you can't be live with us in a concert. But uh, I think it will work out and it's a great chance to tell much more and in really different channels who you are, what you do, and what you want to become in the future. So I think that's a short summary of um, what we're doing here in Zurich, what we try to do, and I hope it's going to work out on the long line perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michaela, for your story and sharing your own experience working in uh, marketing. I think it's useful for those who are watching. And now it's time to close our third block with a discussion. Uh, also, other speakers are joining. Bettina, Hilary, and Michaela is here. Also, we have really uh, two brilliant speakers here from Latvia. One is Eva Ir Irbina, who is a chairperson of the Hansa Perons, the art space we are now, the venue space for music, arts, theater, etc. And also Sandis Voldinch from uh, National Latvian Opera. He's a board member. And uh, we have some questions on Slido.com. And the first one is, uh, what are the most innovative ways Lutzern uh, Festival or uh, and Tonhal Zurich Orchestra as classical organizations have used in their road to digitalization. So what are those innovative ways um, that Luzern Festival and Tonhal Zurich Orchestra as classical organizations have used it um, uh, on the road to digitalization? Whoever wants to answer first. To give a, to give a short answer, um, the use of AE. Um, that's a totally new world for us um, with a lot of new insights and I think that's the most innovative tool we are using at, at the moment. Who else wants to answer this? Yeah, <laughs> it's, yes. it's, a, it's a short answer, but I think that's 
that's the thing as I already um, said in my presentation, it opens your a lot of resources, it opens your, your knowledge to your to your customer, where to put your advertisements and you're reaching them very, very, very uh, exactly where you want you, you get the insights you want. So I think uh, AE is the thing we are going to to use in the future and they're happy, very happy about that. Thank you. Um, so there's another question on Slido asking, um, do you have any example of good cooperation with the digital or IT sector? Maybe companies, maybe sponsorship? Sponsorship, yes. There are different sponsors. There are very innovative sponsors um, around and then there are sponsors that, um, yeah, they 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 promote you in their uh, way but we have um, some sponsors that um, are very keen on, on what we're doing they they love to share their content with their employees because above all in this um, corona period i felt and i was very grateful they continue to support us but they had to have also towards their employees they had to have um, uh, how to say they had to explain why they were continuing to, to promote us, to sponsor us, and then we have set up certain talks with the with, with the employees or for the clients, in order that they also could um, benefit um, still, even though we were not present on stage. Uh, maybe National Opera or Hans Perons has some um, cooperation with IT uh, industry companies. Uh, yes, I think we do have a good an example. I mean, LMTS Trauma, which is basically like Latvian Netflix, let's say it. Uh, they are the partner for innovation for the Latvian National Opera and Ballet. And what we did last year, we did a series of the opera projects um, uh, in, in their platforms. And what we concluded that basically if you put out the digital content in YouTube or you, on your own platform, it doesn't work as well. But when you somehow include uh, already existing platforms and go to where people actually choose to watch TVs, etc., etc., And I think we reached audience, I I think it was uh, around 40,000 uh, viewers, uh, which like for a classical opera isn't an easy number, isn't an easy number. Uh, I mean, who wants to watch like four hours of uh, opera on TV? That's true. Eva, before coming here on discussion, you mentioned that you're using, uh, using a lot of technology in your everyday life, which is very administrative. I mean, lights, uh, other things, maybe you can tell your experience. Because this building is new. We're in Hans Esperons. This is a brand new building. It has been awarded several times for architecture prizes, with design prizes, with like cultural prizes. So it was a place to install all these new things that you can use uh, you know, as a manager. Yeah, um, this building is not new because the building is uh, built in 1902. It was renovated, so in 2017 we started the renovation. Uh, and of course, by renovating the old building and turning it into the new building, uh, that requires a lot of new technologies, especially uh, ones we can use to manage and run the venue um, very eff efficiently. Um, by saying that, I mean that... Um, our technical team can be uh, sitting home and remotely seeing um, what kind of temperature we do have in the room right now and the system set up themselves. Uh, this, that is totally opposite how the opera does. <laughs> opera does that uh, in a, a bit more manual way. Uh, so it's all automatic here. We just set the temperature and, and uh, and it all is like being done by the machines, as well as we can turn off on lights uh, and dim them and move them. Um, that is basically done so we can have a more effective core team that we don't need so many people running around and managing the venue so we can focus on managing the events when they come in. In the first block, we heard a block of conversations. The panelists said that important that the change of this digital transformation happens from the leaders, from like let's say from the up, you know. And we have a question um, in Slido asking how to foster digital culture within the institution among employees. It means you as the managers are those who are the heads, kind of the ups that needs to 
you know, made this transformation happen. Maybe you have, uh, those who are online, maybe you have some good experience working with employees. Me, for example, I work for the National Broadcaster, and we have a culture journalist who are 83 years old, and they use uh, emails, WhatsApp, um, and they're really quick at technology, you know, they need to edit stories really quickly for the news. Uh, what are your experiences with these age groups and maybe employees that uh, need to be motivated to use technology? You can raise your hand and answer, or... Yes, sure, starting. Um, I, I, I suppose my experience is mixed. Uh, I would say that generally um, it's, it's the leadership that need more convincing than the rest of the, my colleagues. They're usually much keener to get their hands on new tools, um, to, to try new things, uh, especially if you have a new tool that you're rolling out and you do it in consultation with them, um, so that they feel involved, uh, they can point out to you what does, doesn't work, um, and you can demonstrate to them and they can find out how it makes their job easier to do or how it makes it, um, how it adds a new rewarding skill to them. Um, so uh, I've, to be honest, I have found it more, uh, it, it's a faster process to convince my colleagues uh, than sometimes it is to convince some of the leadership teams who are more used to doing things in, uh, in, in the way that it has always been done. So what are the other experiences? I would agree to that. Above uh, all, uh, in, in the marketing and communication team, if you're not uh, up to new things or curious, then you're anyhow lost. Um, but um, I remember when I started with the digital first idea about three years ago, people were looking at me like, so where is she coming from? And, um, I, and I say, unfortunately, Corona helped a lot to move on there. I think it's the same as us. Um, a lot of our team members are very open-minded. And as said, the involvement in the whole project and if you are putting up new ideas is uh, very is very important. But I must also admit that our um, our director and um, is, is very open-minded if it comes to to new ideas. So lucky us uh, who can go forward in big, big, big steps if the things are convincing for him. Thank you for answers. Uh, we have another question. Um, what uh, government support would be needed to advance digital transformation in your institutions? We can start maybe with uh, Sandis. Yes, thank you for the questions. I think the good news is that basically the new European structural funds periods in Latvia only starts. So it actually gives us some kind of roadmap where we want to go. And at the end of it, in 2027, there is the ambition that we have changed everything digital, starting from technical processes. I mean, like um, the Lightning System and Latvian National Opera as a stage um, organization has to be done manually um, for every performance separately, which actually takes like uh, eight hours only for the light, uh, Lightning and etc. And as well as managing of the everyday encounters in Opera, there are thousands and thousands of processes which has to somehow come through to, to make a show happen uh, and basically if there's one link just missing there's one not not one decision taken it actually stops all the other process and which is the program we are now working for and I have to say for the previous question you already mentioned I have to agree that uh, the key is that uh, you can show that for the employees it will make their job easier not uh, not more difficult and of course there is in the beginning a very skeptical approach let's face it and uh, there is something charming of course like for opera when you have to somehow manage around 600 people um, in every day just like they have different timetables for rehearsals different um, different decorations and etc etc et and there's something charming about that you have these two uh, people just sitting and writing everything down on the paper and then just putting the notes on the on the on the desk and and then and, and, and the wall uh, but uh, somehow we have to transform it uh, in the future. And this is the ambition we are, have taken for 2027. It's going to take a lot of job. And I think uh, not the least part of it will be convincing of the employees. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Eva, what you want to answer? What gov government support would you need to, to transform even more in digital phase? 
I don't know. I think we, uh, with the hands of parents, we should stop um, where we are at the moment because if we will go uh, any further, we will not be the venue where people meet. And and um, when the COVID started, uh, we realized that the hands of parents is a venue where people should meet physically, and uh, we cannot uh, skip that part. Uh, so for that reason, I would say we need to stop here. But the one thing we should do is we should somehow all together as a sector work on how this customer experience at the moment when we need to scan two or three different codes and manage um, looking at the IDs so, so we can recognize persons coming in with a ticket, with a, with a QR code. So that process is now um, for us here in Latvia, it's, it's taking two times longer for the person to enter, and, uh, enter the venue as it was before. So that is one thing the sector needs in general if we continue and most probably will continue to live in this uh, COVID era for a while. Thank you. Those who are online, do you have any comments what you would need from your governments to, to succeed better at a transformation? Or you, everything's fine? I mean, maybe it's infrastructure. I, mean, I, I, would, I would agree uh, to, I forgot your name, sorry, the lady that just spoke. Um, I think it's, um, the, the, the key thing is really the, the live event. And that's why we were very restrictive with streamings. Um, hybrid solutions are fine, but what you need is resources. I mean, if you, like you said, when you enter a concert hall or a venue, the controls and the checks and whatever you have to set up within the next months, it's the resources that are missing or the money to have the resources, people helping, controlling, do that. Oh yeah, sure. Yes, take the floor. Um, I would, so I would point out that the COVID has decimated our financial model. So we are now at a point where as a museum, we lost most of last year in terms of income. Um, and so we are at a point where, and as most cultural institutions in the UK are, where we're having to um, build better digital resilience and better digital systems and ways of reaching audiences with fewer people and with less money. So um, I, would, I would always say funding, really. Funding for infrastructure, funding for resources to make the transformation that is necessary for organizations to continue to thrive in the future in a more hybrid setup. Yes, it's a good point, thank you. Um, th there's a question for all speakers. What are some of the projects you are working on right now regarding uh, digitalization? Who wants to start? Eva. Uh, yeah, I can share just one experience. Um, um, in this spring, um, we were sitting with colleagues and we thought, oh, we cannot miss uh, one summer again, so we need to do something. And as we have uh, this beautiful outdoor space, so we decided to build uh, the terrace with a, with a stage there so we can do events. Uh, but uh, when we were working on a project, we realized that uh, we don't have any clue when the events might happen, so we need to do something with that project. So we decided to do the, the terrace with a restaurant, basically. And um, at that point, when we were figuring out how to do that, because we are not in a, in a catering business, we are in the venue business and the, and the show business and concert business, so we don't know how to do uh, catering, how to make burgers uh, very delicious. So we found a partner who can do that. Uh, but then again, um, there was one thing we wanted to do. We wanted to do one step, wanted to go one step ahead and think of user experience and how to do that COVID safe. So um, I think we're one of the first who in Latvia implemented the ordering system with the QR codes. And, uh, and we didn't know how that will work, but referring back to the previous question about uh, from where the innovations come from up or from the down, I would say the innovations uh, come from people being lazy enough, so they want to skip one step or two steps. So if they can sit at a table, just scan the QR code and order the food and, and somebody will bring that food and they don't need to go anywhere even to cashier desk, desk to pay so they will use that innovation so that is one thing that we realize that uh, by this by improving that user experience and if we found if we are able to find those um, human laziness factors mm -hmm. we can take out and and uh, put some innovation there that would work and that would live uh, for a longer time yes thank you do you want to share your projects that you're working on now 
Well, one um, smaller have... project is a thing. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, okay, Bettina. Go ahead. <laughs> so one thing uh, Tonal already <laughs> realized is um, uh, the question of uh, digital concert programs. But, um, but the thing we are uh, gaining is not only to have a, a PDF or a, um, a QR code you, you can scan and get your program, but uh, to, to realize a, a concert program that is really digital, that gives um, additional information, that gives links, uh, a, a bigger overview, and uh, is a really digital um, brochure and not, not a longer a, a, a PDF or a concert program. Uh, that's, a, that's a smaller project we are just working on. Thank you. Michaela? Yeah, we, we are sort of, as I said, we're going to move back to our um, old hall. And um, the idea, like Bettina said now, is really to have to use the different channels in order to give to different uh, customer group different information. That is one how we want to use in the future the, the digital uh, channels. And the other one is like also Eva had mentioned before that um, people then coming in the future to the concerts, they can already um, or the digital, either their menus, their drinks or whatsoever, so that things um, are ready in the break, which we did not have before. So that's um, something new, um, we're looking into it as well. And I have to say also, um, I, I got some reactions of rather maybe with elderly clients or customers, they were saying, but don't exclude us. But I feel that there are a lot of elderly people that are very, definitely very comfortable with, uh, uh, with all the digital media and uh, they, they, they really manage. So do not underestimate a certain age group. Thank you. Hilary, do you want to share? Yeah. yeah, well, first of all, I would absolutely agree with what Michaela just said about older age groups. They're, they're online as much as the rest of us. So don't um, underestimate them, um, especially after having a year of having to Zoom grandchildren and deal with the get online, get on social media to, to, to be able to be with their families. So um, I suppose what we're working at uh, at the moment is we are doing um, a bit of a review of all the different ways we tried to adapt across uh, through different departments through um, the pandemic and through the three lockdowns that we had in the UK um, and trying to learn the lessons of what worked and uh, what didn't work and build out on that. So we're right at the very start of um, an, a new refresh of uh, an organizational digital strategy. So that's a big project. Um, and as part of that, I suppose, some of the things that we're exper continuing to experiment with are about learning. So this isn't so much about, um, promoting our exhibitions or presenting our exhibitions and collection online, although we continue, we're, we're always trying to um, iterate and build and improve on that. This one's more about how we deliver um, lots of our learning program, which normally happens in person in the galleries and where and how we might be able to adapt that to be online as well. Uh, thank you, Eva and Sandis. Thank you, Bettina, Hilary, and Michaela for joining us today for uh, discussion. Thank you for finding time to be in the conference. Uh, I hope we, their story is inspired uh, for some actions. I think this was a really practical part. Thank you uh, for discussion. Um, hope to see you live. Uh, hope maybe even in the Riga Jormal Music Festival, which starts quite soon, 16th of July, but it's until the 5th of September you can manage to come to Riga or Jurmala. Um, thank you for, for being here, Eva and uh, Sandis. Uh, thank you, Eva, for the absolutely amazing uh, venue place uh, where it's safe to be and it's quite, uh, quite cool at this heat uh, of summer. And uh, yes, uh, we are about to end the conference. We just ended the third block. And uh, before that, I would like you to again um, uh, stress out uh, Thanks to our partners uh, organizing this conference, which is the Swiss Embassy in Latvia and Society Integration Foundation. Uh, this is happening only because they are supporting us uh, and we can talk about these digital transformations in the future for cultural organizations. It's really nice to get these experiences from all around the world and uh, see how we have survived the COVID-19. What are the things we are taking with us? There are so many things we have to think about. Um, 
for me, I think there's lots, lots of new ideas and lots of new information. But I would like to give the floor to the executive director of Riga Jurma Music Festival, Zana Chulkstan, to say some closing words for this uh, conference. Um, thank you so much. It's been incredibly both in inspiring and and um, valuable. If if I can just. Um, mention a few things I will personally take away and, and, and Riga Jurmola will try to, to implement is uh, firstly I think what Ben told very in the beginning <laughs> digital transformation is really not about technology but about people so how do you change the culture how do you change it within the society how do you or within the institution and how do you change it uh, within or uh, among your audience uh, uh, members that links it to the topics of of digital skills <laughs> that links it to to the topic of of infrastructure um, I was very happy to see that both Ministry of Economics and Ministry of Culture joined to our, our first discussion and and I had a chance to, to have a small chat uh, uh, in between parts, uh, even though I apologize, we planned conference for what uh, total of uh, four and a half hours without any intermission. But nevertheless, uh, I had a small chat and um, and uh, we already discussed a uh, uh, few ideas about what could be done in respect to A, infrastructure, B, skills, uh, uh, and thirdly, in respect to experimentation in this uh, field, because I guess that was another uh, topic that emerged in, in several presentations. Uh, ben spoke about it, London Phil talked about it, Johan spoke about and, and pretty much uh, all, all of the other uh, speakers so yes much like I'm sorry but in startup communities um, you have to assume that not everything will work out but you have to have the time and the means uh, which of course is problematic after this year when we most of us have lost uh, most of our um, income at least from from ticketing and um, and and uh, and so so yes for me definitely Digitalization as a as a as a process, uh, never-ending process. Digitalization as all-encompassing process, so uh, not uh, a separate thing or or a silo. Focus on on people, uh, infrastructure, big topic, uh, skills, big um, uh, big topic, uh, uh, and uh, data, another big topic. So we were already discussing we might do next year a conference that focuses specifically on the on the data in the field of, of culture and how to work with it uh, both artistically also which we know Rick said does very well um, but also of course uh, administratively uh, and then I think there were many also more philosophical questions that were raised uh, about accessibility uh, and democratization we we, we know that uh, the process of digitalization is, is kind of already happening for years now and it's inev inevitable but uh, we should do as much as we can in that respect but but also we shouldn't forget that yes it includes some groups that it didn't include previously but it also does include some uh, does exclude some other groups so very important aspect Having said all of this, uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to all the speakers. Thank you to our supporters, both um, uh, Swiss Embassy in Riga and Sabedrips uh, 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 funds, and uh, but also to our trustees and our supporters of the festival, because they were one of those uh, uh, who continue supporting uh, us during the times when we actually did not have festival and uh, uh, we are very lucky to have both uh, trustees and supporters that that um, have been uh, willing to or have embraced all all the experimentation all the new uh, ideas uh, i presume not everyone <laughs> has been uh, that that lucky uh, so thank you so much. Thank you also uh, to our amazing team who who put it all to, together and make it happen. Uh, and uh, let's finish with, I guess, uh, one of the other 
major <laughs> uh, conclusions is that uh, everything that has to do with digital transformation is really supporting uh, supporting the, the core of our activities. And the core of our activities has always been and will continue being live events. Uh, so we invite everyone from the 16th of July to join us for for uh, for amazing concerts, uh, um, five each weekend and total of four um, weekends. Uh, we have missed out all, on live events already now for one and a half years, and I don't want to upset anyone, but we might be missing out on them again from September with what happens with with Delta. So I know everybody <laughs> have had a rough year and wants to take a just a deep breath and enjoy the sunshine. But trust me, this might be a uh, or chance uh, before another longer break to, to experience also live events. So yes, uh, please uh, join us for the concerts. And thank you so much. Um, I hope to see you not only in the concerts, but uh, next year for, for a conference where uh, Hopefully, we'll be able to already present some of the cases uh, ourselves because we are working on quite a few initiatives. Thank you so much. And Eva, you've been an amazing host. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. I see that we have a Slido again uh, on there. Please open your Slido.com and answer the question, what are the key insights you'll take away from today's conference? And I see a brilliant answer. Never waste a good crisis. While you're writing, I will maybe read down the things that I've wrote down. The key notes that I've uh, taken from today is that, first of all, putting the digital transformation in your strategies, uh, really cooperate to create, um, experiment and share, engage all levels of employees, partners and volunteers, um, care for people, uh, be there for people, not technology, uh, be people-centered, uh, create the feeling of presence uh, with technology as being, uh, for example, in orchestra or being present at the workshops. Uh, also, another phrase uh, that I wrote down was innovation lays in efficiency. The digital transformation starts with leaders involving everyone else, keeping balance between physical and virtual worlds, having enough discussion about data, ease the everyday work using dig digital tools, uh, and there is no way back. Things have changed, and culture and creative industries have to follow. And the last but not least, being brave, being wrong, being creative. And there is uh, more comments, never waste a good crisis. On the Slido, we can see someone wrote, thank you so much, this was amazing. Thank you for joining us and watching us. Digital transformation starts from the top. That's something uh, someone will take uh, home with him. And last thing is share peer-to-peer -peer experience with the teams. Thank you for, uh, for, for watching the conference today. Uh, it will be found online afterwards on Riga Jurmala Festival's website. Also, we will try to cut out uh, speeches and post them online later on. And this was the first ever conference organized by Riga Jurmala Music Festival. But there will be more conferences to follow. This is the first. Uh, it was about the digital transformation. Let's see what happens next year and year after. And uh, as Zana already mentioned, please, please uh, join us uh, live, meet us, uh, talk to us uh, before, after, and in the concerts from the 16th of July until the 5th of September. We'll be there, and um, thank you for being here. I know it's summer outside, and it's, we're a bit tired of online conferences, but it was really amazing having you here. We felt your presence, and uh, we'll see you hopefully soon in the concerts.